So uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here um, today. You know, I've been in my role as CEO of Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital for uh, nine months now, and um, it's been it's been a great adventure, and I'm really grateful to be uh, here today with the team I have. I'd like to start by introducing everybody. So um, to my right, I have uh, Bob Hersey, our CFO, Laurel Ruggles, um, Laurel, Laura Newell, our patient practices, Julie Schneckenberger, our uh, newly appointed chief nursing officer, and Mike Roos, our chief medical officer. We also will be uh, joined a little bit later today by Michael Costa, our, uh, the leader, the CEO of Northeastern Vermont, uh, Northern Counties Healthcare, where I came from. Uh, many of you already know Michael, but they're a great community partner, and he'll be telling part of our story today, but unfortunately, he's tied up on traffic. So when I walked across the parking lot from Northern Counties last winter to NPRH and uh, started my role at the hospital, I communicated to many of our stakeholders our corporators, our board, our staff, our community. What I saw some of the big strategic challenges we have facing Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital and our healthcare system in general. And they are navigating healthcare and payment reform, dealing with this demographic tsunami we have hitting us as our population ages, and closely tied to that, um, our workforce challenges and ensuring that we have the workforce we need to care for that aging population. And I think the story you're going to hear today is the story about NVRH, our budget, our solid budget, which will help us ensure that we are ready to meet those challenges, and the story of how we're rising to the, to the occasion. Um, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Bob to start the dialogue on our budget. Good morning. So we're going to follow the uh, format that was given to us for presentation. So we'll go right through the order one through 10. And I assume you'll ask questions at the end, or we- Yes, we'll, we'll hold them until the end. Hold them until the end. Oh, great, thank you. Uh, so starting uh, on item number two, uh, talking about our net patient revenue change from fiscal 2019 budget to fiscal 2020 budget. Uh, this contains, this table contains a lot of information, so I'm going to spend a few minutes going through it because, again, there's a lot of good data here that explains our revenue growth uh, from fiscal 19 budget to fiscal 20 budget. Uh, starting you know, with the first the commercial rate request, we've asked for a 3.5% rate increase. Um, we determined that after going through all the budget reviewing expenses, reviewing all the revenue sources, reviewing utilization, and then determining what we would need to make our operating margin, which is budgeted at $1.8 million. And it was determined that the 3.5% was what was required to meet that need and fill that gap. Um, it represents about $376,000 for every 1% of rate increase. Um, and we are going to, implement the rate increase by increasing hospital charges by 3.8%, and we will not be increasing the physician charges or provided charges at all. So the weighted average of that uh, formula comes out to 3.5% that we're requesting for a rate increase. Bob, did you want to put your slide up, I think? I'm sorry? Did you have oh, we're just, yeah, I'm we're just, just going by that. this. Uh, would it be helpful if we... Okay. It would be helpful for the, especially the audience. Do we have the yeah, the there, but you can't really see it. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um. <laughs> yeah, the light's not as good as it used to be. <laughs> or, or my eyes aren't as good as it used to be. I'm not sure which. But, hold, uh, hold on. <laughs> We, we improvise. I'm from a farm family. <laughs> so I think anyway, the point. I think I covered all the points about the three and a half percent, how we got there, and how we're going to implement it. Uh, next is the three point seven percent utilization increase. Um, that is spread mostly inpatient. Uh, we have seen a tremendous growth of inpatient uh, this year. 
So our fiscal 19 projected uh, shows uh, about a 20% increase in patient days. Uh, we have been full uh, many times during this year. It's a critical access hospital. We are limited to 25 beds. We really can't staff for more than 25 beds with available resources. And a number of times throughout the year, we've been at that maximum. We're not projecting to be quite that full next year, um, but it has put a tremendous amount of pressure on hospital resources, especially our, our staff on the inpatient units. Um, so they have weighted again, average utilization increase we're projecting is, is 3.7%. Uh, the reimbursement in payer mix, um, a couple things I wanna highlight here. One is as a critical access hospital, Medicare payment is tied to our costs. Uh, charge increases do nothing to affect Medicare reimbursements. Again, as a critical access hospital, it's affected by cost increases. So roughly 38% of cost increases become additional Medicare debt revenue. Uh, we're also seeing an increase in Medicare as a percent of our total business. So putting that, those two together, you can see our Medicare is going up by about two point three million dollars. A combination again of the cost increase uh, and the utilization increase. Uh, the other uh, reimbursement changes are really changes in payer mix. We've seen a little bit of shifting, as I said, from to Medicare from some of the other payers. Um, no surprise given our demographics. No surprise given our demographics. Exactly. Yes. <coughs> Uh, bad debts and free care, uh, we're not really seeing a significant change in bad debts and free care. That's going down a little bit from budget to budget. Um, but as a percentage of gross revenue, it's pretty flat. We've had been pretty flat for uh, quite a while. We've not seen any significant increases or decreases in, in our bad debts and free care. Um, we, uh, during fiscal 2019, acquired the physical therapy practice. Uh, the next item here just is a full year effect. We acquired the practice in December. So the full year effect of adding that practice adds about $200,000 to our, $280,000 to our uh, net revenue. Uh, the dish payment's going up a little bit next year. Um, the other change is our medic the risk associated with the Medicaid next generation uh, model that we're participating in with one care. Uh, when we put the budget together, we estimated based on information from one care that our maximum risk would be about $579,000. Um, actually, since that, we've gotten revised projections for 2019 that shows that it's actually $679,000. And we just recently received an estimate for fiscal 20, it's raised it to $739,000. So our projection for 2020 and net patient revenue is already off by $160,000 or so, but it's an anticipated increase. Um, and so the net, again, the net change uh, percentage wise in our net patient revenue budget to budget is about 7.2%. With that, we're going to turn to the Risks and opportunities. Uh, we combine this you know, hospital issues, risks, and opportunities into one broad category. And I'm going to turn it over to Laurel and Laura for this next discussion. Hey, good morning. Uh, so, first thing we want to talk about is our total cost of care numbers that I think you've all received, and we received the same numbers. I um, want to point out a couple of things. Um, most of that's from 2017 data. And we've looked at that data and also some more recent data that was we have in our own internal systems and also from One Care and from the Blueprint for Health. And I'll, we're happy to say that the, the trend is, head, is heading down. And some of that is uh, due to some of the things that we're going to discuss this morning. So there's really three main reasons for some of the uh, our high total cost of care. Um, the first one is the high cost of what they call advanced imaging. And one of the things that we're just introducing now is in our hospital system is point of care ultrasound, which will provide our clinicians with another diagnostic tool at a lower cost. The second high cost was due to the high prescription medic medication costs. 
And in digging into that data, particularly with the one care data, we found that most of that high per member per month was coming from one patient um, who's getting treated very appropriately with medications. Um, this person lives in our region, but is actually treated outside of our region. And if you take that one patient out, our high prescription medication costs come, come in right at the average with the rest of the state. And then the third area is avoidable emergency department visits, which, as you know, that is really all about access to care, particularly primary care. And I'm going to turn it over to Lauren, and she's going to talk about some of the interesting and innovative things we've already been working on. Good morning. Um, so as we looked at our avoidable ED visits, uh, we came to realize that just below 20% of those visits occur between the hours of 5 p.m. and 8 p.m. So we've committed as a health service area to um, open a convenient care model. Um, what this will be is almost like an urgent type care uh, that will be embedded into our primary care offices. So our patients will be able to walk in at any time to receive care up until the hours of 8 p.m. and hopefully reduce those avoidable ED visits. Um, I'm also happy to announce that all of our primary care offices at this point are fully staffed. Um, we improved our access. I reported last year that our well visits were at one week. They're now down to three days. Um, and our acute visits still hold steady at two days. And that's the third next available appointment method. Um, we still continue to work. Uh, on quality improvement initiatives um, to form a solid relationship with all of our patients uh, so that they feel comfortable coming to primary care versus utilizing the emergency department. Um, we've now uh, worked on a project embedding a psychiatric provider into our PCP offices so our patients can be seen again at their medical home versus having to go to another office. I'm happy to report that we are fully staffed in both the general surgery areas and OBGYN. We've been looking for surgeons for quite a while. And I'd also like to report that both of the physicians that we brought on in those two specialties were welcome providers. So they found MDRH as such a great place to work, they decided to stay. <laughs> Um, last year, some of you might remember that I reported that cardiology, we had a very long wait time. Um, we were out about four months for patients, which is not acceptable. Um, unfortunately, due to physician recruitment uh, issues, CDMC, who we had the contract with, was unable to provide us with any more cardiac coverage. So we decided to shift our contract services to Dartmouth-Hitchcock and they will provide us a dedicated physician four days a week. And so we're super excited about offering that to our community. Um, I'll just mention that we are, we continue to do a lot of quality improvement work as a health service area on our quality measures. We work really closely with Northern County's health care um, to make sure we are we're addressing those issues as a health service area. Thank you. So I want to take just a minute to kind of give a shout out to um, all of our care coordination efforts that we're doing in our community because I'm really proud of the work that we've been doing for the last 10 years. And um, I brought this morning a couple of extra handouts, it's the, the green and the blue sheets. I think many of you are familiar with the, the One Care Care model, the four quadrants, the one, two, three, and four, risk gratification for patients. So what we did in our community with our community partners and our integrated care team is we spent some time this winter really trying to make those quadrants real because you know people are just on numbers and on a chart. And so we were trying to describe you know who are the people that are that are in these categories, what do they look like, who are they, and what services do they need. And so if you look at the, the green sheet and it's two-sided, um, well, this is what we came up with, a description of, of people here. Um, we've got adults on one side and kids on the other side. And, um, and then also on the blue sheet, what we have is we identified what kinds of services that they would require, and also what kind of resources we have in our area that we can provide for them. 
And so I've been getting ready for this hearing last week. I reached out to some of our integrated care team members and I said, you know, I need some stories um, around what you've been doing with care coordination and working with team based care. I can tell you my care board. And all the stories that they were giving me were people who I would say would fall into this category for description. People with very, very complex medical needs layered with complex social needs on top of mental health issues. And they talked about the care, coming together as a team, the care they were giving to people, and really making you know, incremental changes in their health and well-being. Um, maybe finding more stable housing for someone, um, someone who had been to the ED literally 70 times in six months, not visiting the ED anymore because he, um, this, paid, this person is in a, a, a crisis care mental health bed. It's a temporary solution, and we're still working on a longer term solution. But my, my point with this is these are real people. They've got very complicated lives, very complex histories. Um, they're going to require a lot of resources for a very long time, probably for the rest of their lives. And those are the people we're caring for in our community. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues now. So to, to cover the risk section, we have uh, Dr. Roos and Julie Schneckenberg joining us. Good morning. We need a longer table for ABRH uh, for many presenters. Um, so I'm Mike Bruce, the uh, Chief Medical Officer. Um, and, uh, you know, we have had, as Bob said, a very busy year. We've been full a lot of the time. It's been a major stress on the staff, including the hospitalists and the hospitals program. Um, so a couple things I was going to address is um, tertiary care, uh, availability, and skilled nursing uh, care. Um, so uh, starting with tertiary care, um, you may have heard already um, our mini referral center, uh, which is an hour down the road, and UVM both have been full uh, a lot of the time, uh, which is, as you might imagine, somewhat distressing if you're in a critical access hospital in the Northeast Kingdom, you have a very sick patient that you need to try to access a high, higher level of care. And the answer that you get is, we have no beds. You'll have to find another facility. Um, so we've um, had to hold on to some of these patients uh, maybe a little longer than we like. Um, keeping safety in mind, um, or uh, transferring these patients further afield, including as far away as uh, Springfield, Massachusetts, Portland, Maine, uh, Manchester, New Hampshire. So um, we have a capacity issue in the healthcare system in general, and um, in the Northeast Kingdom, we are uh, managing some capacity issues that can be difficult. These are dialysis patients that are needed, patient dialysis, um, cardiac patients that need uh, urgent cardiac care, um, surgical care or intensive care. Um, so uh, that needs to be addressed um, and uh, we're really doing the best we can with it, but um, that is what we're trying to account for with this budget. The other uh, big issue that we're facing, we have two skilled nursing facilities in our region, uh, St. Johnsbury Health and Rehab and the Pines in Louisville. Both are struggling with workforce issues, um, RNs, LNAs, and medical leadership. Um, we are trying to help with those issues. Um, we need those facilities to remain open. Uh, we're talking about 140 people that need that extra level of care, and uh, it would be devastating to our community if we can't keep that up and running. The Pines, I just want to add to that. You don't have to move the mic down. I'll, I'll just talk really loud. Um, but the Pines especially have a lot of uh, older patients with mental health issues. Yes. And they're well cared for today, but um, the, the institution is in a very fragile state, and we're really concerned about it. Yeah. Uh, last thing I was going to talk about is our workforce uh, well-being. Um, we, as you may have heard, uh, last year were um, saddened of, uh, by three major losses of providers, 
um, who uh, took their lives by suicide. We, um, we have undertaken a, a large effort to work on uh, workplace well-being. Um, Sean has been doing individual um, workplace well-being visits with each of the departments, and um, we've uh, got a large committee together, multidisciplinary committee, to work on workplace well-being. At the provider level, we're um, employing a group called Luminos to do um, facilitated uh, workshops with providers to uh, make sure that we're um, aware of what's going on with provider burnout and um, provider um, mental health and um, try to be on top of that. So those are the areas of risk that we're working on for my point of view. Um, so I just want to touch again on the two related items that are um, um, strategic challenges for us. And the first is kind of demographic realities for uh, our region and our patients. We all know that Vermont is uh, the second oldest state in the Union. If you look at median age, we're right behind Maine. And the Northeast Kingdom is the oldest and poorest region of Vermont. So if you look at our median household income, we're at the bottom of the scale, and our median age is at the highest end of the scale. Um, these are the demographic realities that we face when we serve the needs of our community, and it is impacting everything we do. Um, that aging population is the pressure that we're feeling, which is driving demand for services within our community and is putting the tremendous strain that Mike talked about on our staff and our whole system. You know, traditionally we've had a we've had a um, a staffing model that was geared around an average patient census of what about 14? Uh, so we, we, typically, we traditionally average about 14 patients in-house on any given day or night. And in the last year, we've been up around 18. Um, without dramatically changing the staffing model, although you do see in our proposed budget an FT increase to address that. Because when you're dealing with that number of patients through your system, it contributes to the extreme burnout that our staff and patients are feeling, which is why we're putting so much effort and energy into supporting our staff. That also ties into the, to the workforce challenges. We are committed to being the best employer we can be, being the best employer in the Northeast Kingdom. We want to be the go-to place when any professional, IT professional, healthcare professional, where they want to come to work, and we're committed to doing that. And that means helping people navigate and deal with the incredible stress of these very challenging jobs. Um, we also, need to speak to some of the challenges when you have a small community hospital and you have, you know, a, a specialty with one provider, for example, urology or ophthalmology. When something happens to that provider, it can really upend your system. And we experienced that firsthand this summer when our local ophthalmologist, who was not employed by the hospital but served our community and did surgeries at the hospital, lost his license. We now have, in Caledonia County, no ophthalmologists. There are a couple ophthalmologists who operate out of the Newport area, but they're at capacity. And we have no ophthalmology services anymore in our community. We're scrambling to support that ophthalmologist in getting his license back, and we're really trying to be creative in how we meet that community's needs. Our concern is that patients have no place to go, or they're traveling extreme distances for those services. And again, I come back to the demographic challenges. When you have an older population, eye care is really important. Oh, right. They lost their life. He lost his license. His privileges. His privileges were pulled away from two, so we can't even send them across the river anymore. Um, that had a direct impact on our budget, um, but more importantly, has a direct impact on the quality of care and the care that our patients are able to receive within our community. Uh, some of the other risks that we're dealing with is the, the high cost of Wolcombs and temporary staffing. Uh, we put our budget together for 2019. We estimated about $300,000 of temporary staffing for nurses, uh, other healthcare professionals, and physicians. 
Uh, we're projecting that we'll actually spend about $3.2 million in fiscal 19 on temporary staffing costs. Uh, we're working hard to put new uh, resources into our recruitment efforts. We've hired somebody dedicated to recruiting, uh, and we're putting together a competitive wage and, package, wage and salary package that uh, should help us as well. Uh, but we're still budgeting in 2020 about $1.2 million of uh, temporary staffing costs. Uh, we're hoping that that's enough. Again, we're putting all our efforts into making sure we can recruit people and retain them. Uh, but it's, it's a pretty competitive market out there for a number of healthcare professional uh, positions. Uh, one of the other risks that we're facing is the need to add uh, FTEs. Um, you know, as, as a CFO, you know, I hate to see costs increasing. But I also have to recognize the fact that our employees have been working at capacity or above uh, for a good part of the year. Uh, we need to support them. Uh, we need to support them for their safety, the safety of the patients, and to just provide good quality care. Uh, so we are putting efforts into there's a, about a 17 FTE increase between our budget for 2019 and our budget for 2020. Uh, believe me, I looked at all those uh, justifications, and those positions are definitely needed. The other risks that is always out there for hospitals that rely on the 340B program, there's something happening to that that would reduce the benefit to us. Uh, in total, the 340B benefit is about $3 million a year to us between what we save in costs and what we uh, receive through the retail 340B program. Uh, and just our bottom line is $1.8 million. If we didn't have that $3 million, we'd be in the hole by $1.2 million. Uh, the other thing the 340B program allows us to do is to provide you know, some uh, medications to patients that can't afford them. That's for our Community Connections program. Uh, and it also helps us. We provide about $14.7 million a year in community benefit. That's calculated right on the Form 990 every year. Uh, that $3 million benefit from 340B helps us to be able to continue to provide that level of community benefits uh, each year. Uh, but I meant to tell you that, that we will talk at the FGE increase that I mentioned. We'll walk through a table in a bit that goes through the, the, those new positions. Uh, the other risk and opportunity, as I mentioned before, is the One Care and Next Generation Medicaid program. And then we have downside risk, uh, but there is a potential for upside risk in the same amounts that I, I mentioned earlier. Uh, so those are some of the key risk areas that we're facing uh, this year. Um, the last one that Julie's going to talk about is the needs of, of dealing with the mentally ill and substance abuse disorder patients at Good morning. Um, so the uh, mentally health of ill and substance abuse um, patients that we see at the hospital are quite complex at times and we um, are unable to keep patients in the ED. We don't have a space for segregated um, beds for them to stay as other hospitals do. So we have um, built a, a unit at the end of the med, one end of the med search unit. It's not a unit, it's really beds. It's just transition beds, um, four um, beds that we can house these patients in and care for them there away from the goings on of the uh, rest of the med search unit where we're having patients recover from total joint surgeries, medical illnesses, and we've, we've just moved them away so that they're in a safer place for themselves, the rest of the patients on the unit, and um, it's a quieter place for them to be cared for by our nurses. We've had um, one in particular patient recently that actually taught us a lot about um, some of our risks involved with caring for these patients. Um, excessively violent, very vocal, um, unpleasant language um, coming from that particular patient. It took a lot of staff to care for that patient. Um, it also made some of the patients that were being cared for, uh, med surge patients, very uncomfortable feeling that they may not be safe on our unit. And that's very disturbing to everyone because we do keep them safe. And um, so we're, we're just trying to mitigate some of that um, discomfort for everyone to have them in a separate unit. We um, have not 
had a lot of mental health nurses available to us. Nursing typically does not get the same education in psychiatry that I had 35 years ago. They just don't have that, that exposure. So it's uh, led to some turnover on the unit of nurses not wanting to be in that environment. They wanted, they came to a small community hospital to take care of their community members. So we've been dealing with some of that. But we are fortunate to have a couple of nurses on staff that are very interested in caring for the mental health patients and we're working on some education, further education for them to make everybody feel safer. And can I just, yes. I'm gonna interject again. Um, no, it's okay. Uh, I'll just talk loudly again. The, um, we, I think we've been very innovative in how we support these patients and we've had to be because the, the, the challenge we face is, although there may be mental health, health beds available throughout the state, the response we get when we try to find placement for these patients in appropriate care facilities is that the patient is too acute to go to a, a facility dedicated to their support. So they end up staying with us. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So moving on from uh, hospital issues, risks and opportunities, uh, to the financial health of the hospital. There we go. So I want to highlight a couple of things uh, on this table. Uh, first is our operating margin has been fairly consistent uh, as a percent of uh, patient revenue for several years now, I think going back, all the way back to 2014. Uh, we're always trying to maintain an operating margin of you know, 1.5 to 2 percent, and uh, we've been able to do that. Uh, and we are planning to increase our operating margin gradually, gradually, between now and fiscal 22, uh, and to fund a much needed emergency department expansion. Uh, we'll talk in more details about that soon, but we need to start now preparing financially, building up the balance sheet in order to support that project in, in a few years. Uh, our day's cash on hand went up a bit during this year. Uh, I'm sorry. Yes. Our day's cash on hand is lower than the peers. We're building it up next year. So it came down a bit this year, in part because of our acquisition of the Northern Physical Therapy practice. We're building it back up during this year and next year. Again, looking forward to the PD project in, in a few years. Our capital structure is solid and improving. Uh, that's important because we're going to need to borrow money for that ED project, somewhere between 9 and 11 million dollars around fiscal 22. So we need to be able to have the tech capacity to, to make that happen uh, and to maintain uh, financial health. Uh, so we're in a position where that is possible. Um, the cost metrics, I, I will say, if you look at the uh, some of the Productivity measures, salaries, uh, or FTEs for just occupied bed. Uh, they're projected to go up a little bit, but still, I think, well within industry standards. Uh, last thing I want to touch on is that these net accounts receivable. Uh, those went up a bit during this year. Uh, we went through a computer, computer conversion. Um, I think anybody that goes through a conversion will tell you, uh, especially from the CFO position, that it's not a pleasant experience. Uh, Cash does go down, cash receivable does go up, uh, but uh, we're past that and depending <coughs> on the right direction, uh, the AR is going down and again, cash is bouncing back up. So I'm happy to report we've made it through that uh, well, crisis, but we'll bump in the road. Thank you. Uh, the next one is with, uh, more financials. The, uh, is the profit and loss of balance sheets. Um, we, we've talked about the, the net page of revenue growth, 7.2%. Uh, I went through some of those details uh, previously. Um, the next we'll talk about a little bit is the growth in operating expenses coming up uh, in a couple of pages. Um, just looking at the balance sheet again, we're going to build the cash up to keep the accounts receivable down. Uh, Keep maintaining our ability to borrow money. Um, I just want to highlight the one number up there accounts payable that looks like it's five million dollars. A lot of that is our employees earn time back, about uh, almost three million dollars of that. Our employees are able to accrue and maintain a balance of their earn time. So a large portion of that uh, liability, uh, the accounts payable liability is related to our, our salary uh, benefit, particularly the earn time uh, 
carry the project. <clears throat> Flipping to the, the next page, uh, this is the expense drivers and the, the growth in our expenses that I can touch upon. Uh, new positions, you know, eight hundred and seventy-five thousand um, dollars. Seems like a large number. Certainly gave me pause when I, when I put it together and saw the, the total. Uh, but you have to look at the fact of what we're spending on open tenants and staffing. You know, we need to provide adequate staffing so that we can recruit employees and retain them, not uh, have them come and, and want to leave because of the constant uh, the stressors of being overworked and having to deal with too many patients. We, we try and maintain appropriate staffing levels in inpatient units in all of our departments. And, and to do that, then we're going to need to add FDEs. Uh, most of our FDEs, uh, save for one, are clinical areas. Uh, MBRH, if you look historically, we have the lowest overhead percentage as a percentage of our total expenses of any, all the hospitals. I think there's actually one, so maybe we're second lowest, the lowest, depending on the year you look at. But the resources that we're putting in are clinical areas, again, to provide patient care, making sure our staff is supported properly. Um, inflation increases, um, it's about less than 1%. You look at what we're actually planning for non-salary related inflation. Uh, we're struggling and working hard to keep those costs down, uh, manageable supply and other uh, controllable costs. And again, we're looking at a 0.9% increase related to inflation. Um, a salary and wage program, Highlighting again is important. We need to be able to provide salaries that are competitive uh, to recruit and retain employees in, in a very competitive market. So we put money in the budget so, to help us do that. Uh, our fringe benefits are going up. You know, health and employees uh, need health care coverage as does everybody else. Um, and we're putting in a new benefit as well uh, to help us again recruit and retain employees. It's a, Loan repayment. We have a number of employees who've gone through college, came out of college with student loans, uh, and we're implementing a new program to help them pay some of that student loan back. Um, that is a new, again, new this year. Uh, supplies, the volume, a lot of this is volume related. We're working hard to, through the supply chain, uh, the purchasing program, to reduce the cost of our supplies. We're budgeting $90,000 in savings uh, through, you know, maximizing the purposes through a, a major GPO supplier uh, and to work with our providers to make sure that there's as much standardization as possible on the supplies that they're using in the OR and in different parts of the hospital. Um, this number, by the way, that you see here, the $265,000 is gross. It does not include the savings, which are shown in a different line item. Uh, drug costs, um, I'm sure you've heard of the increase in the purchase uh, the Increasing drug costs spring. Uh, the critical access hospital will be more fortunate with the 340B program. Our cost savings have grown uh, since 2017 about $500,000. Uh, in 2020, we're projecting a million dollars a year in cost savings in the 340B program. Uh, Director Pharmacy does a great job making sure that we're maximizing those, those savings. Again, that number is gross. The savings are shown elsewhere. IT related, you know, we're implementing a new electronic health record. Um, comes with a warranty for a year, but those warranties are going to be up September 1st. So we need to budget some money for increased maintenance contracts on the new system. Uh, appreciation is just our, our MRI project. So we're going to touch on that, but that'll come online next year. And this year, past year, we completely renovated our birthing center, edited it, completely rebuilt it. Uh, so the cost of that appreciation on that project is coming online as well. We had some interest savings from that borrowing. Might we anticipated perhaps some borrowing in 2019. That's being pushed off to 2020. Uh, the provider tax is going up as a percentage of our net patient revenue. As that goes up, the provider tax will go up automatically by about 6%. The physical therapy practice transfer again and costs that the full year uh, in impact uh, the building budgets, budgets. Uh, and the last uh, item is our ACO infrastructure fees. We uh, underfunded it last year, it was our first year. When we put the budget together, we didn't have a good estimate of what those fees would be. Uh, so working year to year is a growth of about $125,000. Uh, 
I think the savings of 290,000 I mentioned, that's mostly the incremental 340B savings year to year, and the supply chain savings are <coughs> Um, so, <clears throat> some of the, the cost containment efforts that I haven't mentioned, um, you know, we as a leadership team require justification for any new service, any new FTE, in terms of a process to, to evaluate those. And, and we do a lot of purchasing of equipment, as you can imagine. Uh, and we use a service called ECRI, um, which we get through our affiliation with the Northern Alliance to help. Um, and every purchase that we make, is run by ECRI to make sure we're getting the best possible price. And it's been a great tool to help us uh, to make sure we're getting maximum savings on all of our equipment purchases. The next, yeah, the next is the, the FTE increase that I, I said I would cover. Um, putting, uh, again, increasing efforts as Laura well mentioned in our physician practices. Uh, providers uh, looking to expand convenient care slash urgent care services in, in the community and supporting those providers is going to add to 6.8 FTEs. Uh, expanding coverage in respiratory uh, because we've had so many patients and because we're putting a lot of pressure on our nursing staff we need to have respiratory coverage 24-7 uh, we're not had so putting resources uh, into that. Um, our EP volume we are staffing this emergency uh, nurse association as guidelines to use for appropriate staffing in the emergency room. Uh, with our volume increases, with the QB increases that we're seeing in our emergency room, we need to make sure we're staffing appropriately again for the safety of the staff and the patients. Um, we're going to have a new position, um, providers that come on and providers that are in the hospital, even, even non-providers, we're finding need a lot of support with the electronic health record to make sure that they're getting, uh, being as efficient as possible in use of that. Um, so we have a dedicated person that's going to help just onboard new providers, but also help with the existing providers to make sure that standardization and everybody's aware of all the ways to, to maximize their efficiency in use of that system. Um, we. Uh, probably the uh, next actually environmental services. Volume increase, acute increase in ED and med surge. We need to make sure that uh, housekeeping environmental services staff is adequately, uh, staff adequately that handles a constant turnover. Um, we have patients, for example, waiting in the emergency room. Um, we should have brought a slide. We have nine emergency room beds, and we actually now have to have six hallway beds. We actually have place markers for six beds in the hallway around the nursing station. Patients waiting either to go upstairs or waiting to get into a little exam room. Uh, so we need the support staff from, from environmental services to help clean the rooms and turn the rooms over quickly so that we can move the patients through but, uh, to the appropriate location. Yeah, let me interject there because one, one thing that I've discovered in my nine months at NVRH, can you can hear me okay? I think you should use the mic. Okay. One thing that I've discovered in my uh, nine months at NVRH is who knew that hospitals run on laundry? Right? It's unbelievable. But every time a bed turns over or you have a new patient come to the emergency department, those are linen changeovers that have to ha happen. So as our volume of patients has increased, the number of patients we've seen has gone up, so has the volume of laundry we do. And that has put tremendous strain on that workforce. Um, and it's, it's, it's really fascinating to see, it, it, you know, think about just seeing patients or, or providers and the need for providers, but, but it impacts everything we do with the hospital. As of the other positions that are listed up there, um, I think we might be able to see them actually. Um, we have a chief medical officer who you met, uh, and it's a half an FTE increase uh, for that position. Uh, we're increasing the hospital services again, uh, more patients up there, a lot of pressure on our hospital services, uh, and we're uh, increasing our behavioral health and clinical quick care coordination in our physician practices. There's one practice that did not have a behavioral health specialist embedded uh, in it, and we're now going to embed a behavioral health specialist in that practice. And we have eliminated some positions. You know, as physicians become vacant, we do go through a process of evaluating them and have eliminated some positions as a result of that process. 
Uh, next, we were asked to do an update of reconciliation between 2019 approved budget and 2020 full year, I'm sorry, 2019 full year. So, the budget to projection of uh, reconciliation. Um, some of the key things that, uh, that are on here. Uh, the first is the fixed payment, the payment. That's just, we didn't break that out in the, the budget initially. Uh, and we put the budget together, we didn't have a good uh, handle on what those amounts would be. Uh, through the year, we've been able to, to determine that. Uh, the, uh, this year, we're projecting the 340B revenue will be down a little bit. There's just a delay in capturing some of that, uh, that revenue on some of our providers. Our reference lab, we last year took reference lab out of operations and put it into the other revenue, and we just missed it. We just grossly understated both the revenue and expenses associated with that. Recognize that during the year and, and rectify it as we went through the year. Uh, salaries, we've got a number of vacant positions. Again, we've had to fill those with temporary staffing at a much higher cost. Um, the health insurance increases uh, through the year, uh, and the pharmacy benefit cost increases, so improving up our fringe benefits. Um, the provider tax, again, just tightened revenue that we projected. Um, depreciation, again, additional equipment purchases during the year. And the bond issue, as I mentioned, was not, did not happen and that helped our interest, growth and interest expense to be down. So those are the key uh, Arkansas items to meet fiscal 19 budget and fiscal 19 projected. And you can stop listening to me for a while. <laughs> 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 Also, does Michael need to be sworn yes, in? He does, yes. Let's swear him in. Right. Should Michael Costa, who is the CEO at Northern Times Healthcare, and probably known to most of you. Do you want to swear him in? Yes. Thank you. So, uh, clarifying information telling the hospital's financial story. Um, our story really is all about our community, and I'd like to um, open this section by uh, recognizing some people that we have in the room here that. Um, really represent our community. And I'm going to ask, we have a number of our board members here today, and I'm going to ask our board members who are in the audience, if you guys can just stand up and be recognized for a moment, please. I know I'm putting down the slot. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not sure if members of our boards of our critical access hospitals get enough recognition for the amount of work and effort and energy they put into uh, ensuring that our hospitals are meeting the needs of our community. But these folks, I have watched them work countless volunteer hours um, supporting our staff, looking at our numbers. Um, Tom, our board chair, would probably tell you that it's a part-time job, and it really is. I mean, the amount of work these people put in. And they are the voices of our community, them along with our corporators, that help guide and steer the strategic direction of the hospital. Now, there's a reason why uh, the, this board and the folks at NDRH asked me to leave the organization coming from within our own community in the Community Health Center. It's because of our relationship to the community and our partnerships and our sense that we're all in this together meeting the needs of our community. The partnerships go beyond just our health service area, but we're also building on our relationships and our partnerships with other healthcare institutions. For example, North Country Hospital, we just expanded our sleep disorder center with them, and we're exploring other opportunities to do that same thing, because we recognize that those partnerships will be critical to meet our community's needs moving forward, especially when we are resource constrained and workforce challenged. Another area that we're starting to have early conversations with is around occupational health. We have an occupational health program at NDRH. It's a strong program. 
and right now there isn't one in the Newport area. For financial reasons, they had to cut it a couple years ago. But there are a lot of employers in the Newport area that need access to those occupational health services. You know, manufacturers that have injuries on the job, big ski areas like J, etc. who are looking for those services. So we're exploring how we partner with North Country Hospital to, to, to serve that need within our community. Um, I think part of my job here today is to kind of tee up uh, Michael Costa um, to talk a little bit about our community collaborations, NEK Prosper, our accountable health community, and why that is so incredibly important to the future of the health and well-being for the people we serve. Michael, you ready for that talk? All right. Good morning, and my apologies for being a bit of a distraction. Uh, there is adversity in modern American healthcare every day, and today we're free to not. And so, but I'm really grateful to be here with our partners from MBRA to tell a little bit about uh, the community story of our partnership and where it is today and how important it is and perhaps where it's going tomorrow. Uh, the board and many people in the room know me through my work uh, with Governor Shulman's office and then as Deputy Commissioner of the State Medicaid Program. And as one of the people working to draft and implement the all-payer model and to set up the Medicaid Next Generation ACO program, I was bothered by a couple questions, which is, does any of this stuff work? Does any of this stuff in healthcare reform really matter for Vermont and Vermonters? And what I came to realize about my position in Medicaid, which really was the, the best job I ever had in my life, and allowed me a great opportunity to do good work on behalf of the state, was that it was a little bit like an obstructed view seat at Fenway Park. Uh, I knew I was at a baseball game, I generally knew what the score was, Generally, knew if people were happy or sad, but I couldn't see the field. And the only way to test whether any of this worked was to be out in the provider community. And at that point, it's no accident that I landed in the Northeast Kingdom because I think consistently in the years that I've been working on healthcare in the state, the Northeast Kingdom generally and NBRH specifically through Paul Bankston and Bob and Laurel and now Sean have been really committed to wearing their community hat first and trying to think about how do we really make sure that this works for everybody? Uh, and so for me, um, part of what drew me was the work that we do in NEK Prosper, which really asked five really straightforward questions about our organizations and about our communities, which is, are we physically healthy? Are we mentally healthy? Are we well housed? Are we well nourished? Are we financially secure? And so for me, going to Northern Counties Healthcare, which is an FQHC, a home health and hospice agency, serving the Northeast Kingdom with strategic partnerships with NBRH and North Country and Copley Hospitals, was an opportunity to work on that every single day. Uh, I 100% believe it's the right choice because I get to work on how things ought to work in the community and how things ought to be different in the future. I think a lot of us worry about a healthcare innovation bubble where there are lots of really smart people spending all their time trying to change the system. At the same time, there's a much larger group of people that actually care for people every single day who sometimes think, what are those people doing? And so I think uh, NBRH is one of those hospitals that not only talks about how we innovate and care, but it actually does that on a daily basis. And so uh, my piece of it is to work in partnership on NEK Prosper. And when I talk to my board of directors about NEK Prosper, I say, look, it allows us to do three really interesting things. It allows us to come together with many community partners, really driven and led by NBRH and a few other key organizations, to say, what does our community really want? How, how do we actually determine community intention, right? Two, how do we invest in prevention? One, one of, the, to me, the amazing stories in Vermont healthcare reform is that NBRH takes its capitated payment from the ACO and takes 1% off the top of that to invest in prevention. Uh, and that is really putting your money where your mouth is when it comes to healthcare reform. And then three, how do we work on prosperity in the community? And so thinking about what type of investments do we need to make uh, downstream to make people healthy and to make our communities more prosperous. I, I think when we were setting up the all pair model in 2015 and 2016, uh, if you had told me by 2019 there would be uh, a hospital that was taking part of its payments and putting it into prevention and convening its community several times a month to do actual work, 
uh, and to work on bigger picture prosperity issues. I would say, hey, I don't know whether um, it's ultimately going to be successful, but we are definitely on the right track. This is exactly the type of stuff that we wanted to see when we set up that system. And so I'm really grateful for the leadership of NVRH. Um, Northern County's healthcare has its part of it because a lot of what we do now is centered on primary care and we're grateful to be there. Um, and I sort of knew that the healthcare reform part was going to work well, and it has, and we're grateful to be part of that. What I didn't know when I took my job was how much the operations of Northern County's healthcare and NVRH are a collaborative thing. Uh, Chris Town, who's in the audience today, who's our director of primary care operations and is outstanding, uh, works with Laura Newell, uh, who spoke earlier, and Laurel and others all the time to try to make sure that our operations are integrated so that uh, it works for our patients instead of being a burden for our patients. I think one very specific example is that like a lot of Vermonters, our patients struggle with uh, the financial aspects of healthcare. One specific example is laboratory fees. And so we came to an agreement with NVRH over the past year to redo lab fees for our patients in a way that um, I think serves the community really well and tries to get out affordability. When it comes to recruitment, I know that we, much like NVRH, view it as a win if someone is interested in the Northeast Kingdom and takes a position with us or NVRH or North Country or NKHS. It is not a fight between us, it's more of a how can we get people to understand that this is an amazing place to live, work, and raise a family. And it's a win for us if anybody wants to come into the community. Uh, I've been with Sean and Brian Nall at North Country Hospital uh, and Gail Eau Claire at Little Rivers. FQHC, as we talk about what, if anything, we can do to support moms and kids. Uh, and I really credit NVRH for, as usual, being a real leader about how we work on collaboration. I, I can't, or that sounds so simple, but I can't overstate its importance. There are really only two theories of the case in healthcare reform, competition or collaboration. Vermont is clearly all in on collaboration, which means it's a big resource allocation problem. And I think NVRH is really excellent about saying, okay, how do we, put on our community hat first, work through the problem in a community-oriented way, and then all figure out what this means for our respective organizations, and how do we best leverage the strengths of our organizations instead of duplicating uh, what might already be out there. That, that's probably the 100,000 foot view of our collaboration, uh, and what NEK Prosper looks like. The thing I truly love about NEK Prosper is that it doesn't stop at 100,000 feet. It gets down to the nitty gritty of, okay, we're all in, we're on task, we're on message, but what are we really going to do? And to give an example of where that conversation is moving forward, we have an ACO 18 meeting that meets every month to talk about the ACO program. And I think Sean and I are very well aligned on the following thing, which is, okay, at some point in the future, we entirely delink healthcare payment, and when people visit our organizations, what would we do differently? What would we buy that's different? How would we serve people that are different? And I think we're trying to get to that same conversation on all of those five major questions. Are we physically healthy, mentally healthy, well-nourished, well-housed, and financially secure? Um, and so to the extent that we can all agree that strong hospitals need strong communities, uh, we're really passionate about supporting NVRH in the budget process and look forward to being great partners with them in the future. Can I just about jump in one? Then we'll pass it over to Laurel. Uh, really incredibly grateful to have partners like Michael and his team at Northern Counties to drive this uh, work forward. You know, I thought for a long time, what's the single most important thing we could do to improve the health and health outcomes for the community we serve? It's raise the median household income. Think about that for a second. Raising the median household income means that people can better afford care. They can better afford housing. They can buy nutritious food, and they can build a future for their kids that will be better than the life they had. And NEK Prosper and our collaborative partnerships to get at addressing the social drivers of health is the vehicle that enables us to work on that initiative, and it's incredibly important for all of us here to do that. The 1%. Oh, right. Uh, I know, um, I think, Michael, you touched on it. Uh, one of the things that we've committed to as part of our partnership with OneCare and our participation in, in the ACO, you know, there's always been a lot of talk 
about um, kind of accountable care organizations, the model that if you can achieve some savings, that you can then invest those savings into social drives for health or, or, or the social driver work. I've long held that that's a, that's a uh, chimera. There is no such thing as shared savings. It doesn't exist because this year's shared savings is next year's bottom line budget and it's impossible to get to. So we flipped that on its head and we've said, okay, we're in on the ACO, we're participating in the Medicaid risk track, and we're gonna take 1% of our revenue from that program and dedicate it to this work. And our hope is that in the coming years, we can grow the percentage that we're committing, but we are building it into the budget. That's what we're doing. And this, I think, is a paradigm shift and is incredibly important to how we're delivering care in the our communities. So and just two quick things. Uh, with the prevention fund that Sean just described, I can tell you for our organization, it gets us to think in a different way, uh, in a data-driven way. And so just to give you one example of how it made our folks think differently, though, this is not a project we're working on right now, uh, you know, we talk about food insecurity. And for example, we have a site up in Island Pond. It's pretty far out there, it's a tight-knit community. As Sean said, um, it's an older community, income's low, acuity healthcare-wise is pretty high. And something that they've noticed is, you know, we do one food distribution a month uh, through community folks up there, and by the end of the month, people are really struggling. Uh, you know, is there any way that we could pay for a second food distribution? And then they say, well, we know, Michael, since we've now known you for five months, you're gonna ask about the data. Is there any way to use that as an opportunity to create a data set of food insecure people and then try to link that to their healthcare utilization to figure out whether their utilization and cost is any different during that time of the month than, for example, other folks on our patient panel? And so it just gives us the opportunity to think in a totally different way. Instead of waiting for that person to show up at the emergency room or to be in mental health crisis because they can't feed their family. And so it just gives us a real, NVRH's commitment on the prevention fund just really opens a lot of doors for our whole organization and community to think in different ways. I think the risk of something like this is, this feels like exactly the right work, um, but you have to be careful, is it just us or is it really moving the needle? And I will tell you that uh, the FQHC, the Federal Oversight Agency, HRSA, came to visit a bunch of Vermont and New Hampshire sites over the past couple months, and they came to visit Northern County's Healthcare to talk specifically about NEK Prosper. Because everybody's talking about collaboration and they wanted to talk about this example of people doing collaboration. Uh, and what they said to us at the end of that meeting was, hey, if, this is not a promise, but if we could make a one-time investment in NEK Prosper in this type of work, what would you ask for? What would you buy? And so we're putting our heads together to try to figure that out. I bring it up just an example of other people seeing this and thinking, hey, you're on the right track. Um, and we're curious about this being a replicable model either in other spots in Vermont or broader geographically. And so, um, you know, we're only able to do this in part with NBRH's partnership and their financial commitment. And, you know, I would really urge you to allow them to continue to be able to make these types of investments. So now I get to talk about some of the benefit to uh, our community from our hospital. And we have, I want to thank everyone from our community. This is your fans. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. These are our fans of NBRA. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. Thank you all for making the trip over this morning. So NBRH, we are the, by far the largest employer in our region. Uh, last year, we were actually voted the best employer in the Northeast Kingdom by a poll done by the California Record. And using some kind of standard multipliers uh, that are out there, we estimate that we add about $50 million to the local economy. $50 million. $50 million. Um, so we also have our community benefit reporting that we report on through Schedule H of our 990 to the IRS every year. Um, we just completed that. Thank you, Terry. As Bob mentioned, we had $14.6 million in community benefit, which includes charity care. That's 17.6% of our total expenses, which is really on the high side of hospitals across the country. 
anything that we use, um, whenever we make decisions around allocating money towards community benefits, we use our community health needs assessment as a uh, as a guide to decide how we're how we're going to spend that money. Um, I also want to point out there's a the, the slide this up there right now. They, we have several different ways of funding interventions in the community, um, two of which, one that you just heard about from Sean about our, the newly created Healthy Sense Fund that comes off the top from our ACO payments for Medicaid, that comes, comes out of hospital operations, comes out of the bottom line. And then also any of our community benefit funding initiatives that we talk about, that is also comes directly out of our hospital operating bud budget. So we need a healthy bottom line in order to be able to provide those funds. So last year, you may remember I talked about uh, a program that we were going to launch in this fiscal year. We call it Rights to Work. This came directly out of our community health needs assessment process. It was first brought to my attention by Mary Grant, who is the executive director of our uh, regional transportation, public transportation agency, RCT where she said, you know, Laurel, the real gap in transportation in our area is around people trying to find transportation to work. Through the community health needs assessment, that was also verified when I went to speak to some reach up participants about barriers for them to find a job. They, they said the same thing. Um, that's where the gap in transportation is. So I went to um, a couple of the counselors at Voc Rehab to just confirm what they were seeing and also to do some problem solving around that issue. And that's where the Rights to Work program was launched. So I want to tell you um, a story about one of the people that we've been able to help with the Rights to Work program in the, the last year. And I chose this story because I, I actually got to meet this, this young man because he came to my office to drop off the repair order for his car. So I'm going to call him Ted. That's not his real name, although he did give us permission to tell his story today. So he's um, a young man. He's worked with Vogue Rehab for about eight years. He had um, a history of some anxiety and some anger issues. So over those years working with uh, Voc Rehab, they were able to capitalize on his strengths, which one included he was very artistic, very skilled artist. And one of the things that he wanted to do was to be able to give back to the community by um, helping keep people heal through art. So over time, um, he was able to find a job, get an apartment, buy a car, um, he's teaching, in a, he's working in a local school, and he also teaches art to kids on the side. So he's very self-sufficient. He came off disability benefits, very self-sufficient. And then all of a sudden, he has this, these looming car repairs. He, his car needed, let's see, it was brakes and wheel bearings. So I'm not a mechanic but I listened to car talk enough over the years so that I know that you should not be driving your car if it needs brakes or wheel bearings. <laughs> so for just a little under, let's see, it was about $600, we were able to pay for his car repairs and literally get him back on the road. So I have, in the last year, almost a year, I have five other people with similar stories uh, where we, re repaired their car, bought snow tires. We've spent about just $3,100 to do this and about another $400 in gas cards that Vogue Rehab gave out. And so this just shows that if you have the right partners coming together with just a little bit of money, you can make a huge difference in people's lives. And that's why I'm proud to work at NBRH. Can I just build on that story, Laurel? Yeah. Um, there's uh, another story, I, I think we just got off the ground or getting it off the ground around rise to wellness. There was an employer in the Newport area that's been struggling to find workforce. And they reached out to Vogue Rehab and said, hey, we're, we're willing, we're, we're a multi-shift operation, but if we can find four or five people from the St. John's Bay area who are willing to come up and make the drive up to Newport for this job, We'll make sure, this is the private employer, so we'll make sure that they all work the same shift and we'll provide a van. Um, 
that the employee will ultimately pay for, but if you can cover the cost of that man service for the first, what was it, month until they start getting paychecks rolling in, then we could pull the whole thing together. And so uh, I think through us in Vote Rehab, we said, sure, let's make that happen. Um, that is a really good example of a public-private partnership where we're helping a local business get employees into their uh, job, helping people step up. Yeah, I just got an update on that yesterday. It's probably going to be 12 people. Holy cow. Yeah. So they'll be able to ride from the St. Johnsbury area to their um, good-paying job in Newport every day. Awesome. So next we're going to talk about our capital plans. I think we're going to take, we'll go back a page. Um, I'm just here for you to read. I'm not going to touch on all of them, but I just want to point out a couple of key things. Uh, the first our MRI project. Uh, very excited to report that that's still on time and on budget. What I didn't put in the note here is that we're actually up, able to upgrade to newer technology equipment than what was in the original CO and application at no additional cost. I'll take that back. It was about $10,000 of additional cost. So minimal, it won't add to the project cost. We've got that covered in our contingency. But very excited that we're able to upgrade the technology at, at no additional cost on that project. Um, the other things are, are here that you can, you can read. Um, highlight that we uh, the capital budget uh, is reprioritized every month. You know, things change. We put the budget together in July. Uh, and it doesn't end until 18 months later uh, when we start the process. So we do reprioritize uh, every, every month at a committee meeting. Uh, and then our ED project. I touched on it a couple times. I think we talked about it last year. Um, Brian was not able to attend to, to help us, as you can see in the footnote we were going to ask him. Uh, he's not here. Uh, so I, I do want to highlight that just by today's standards, if we would have filled the same ED with the nine rooms, uh, which was built in 1972, we would have to add 2,200 square feet uh, just to comply with today's standards. So right out of the gate before we even start the project, we need to add that number of square feet uh, just to comply with today's standards. Uh, and then we need to expand that for a number of reasons that you heard. We talked about the hallway beds. Uh, we talked about dealing with patients with mental illness and, and, a, and a place to put them. Right now we put them upstairs in our medical surgical unit. Our, planning to add capacity right in the emergency room so that we can safely care for them uh, without putting them upstairs. And I talked a little bit about how we're going to fund it. Uh, again, repeating, we're planning to build up our balance sheet and, and debt uh, capacity so that we can pay some cash, uh, do some borrowing, we're going to do some philanthropic support for the project as well. And we're actually looking to do new market tax credits. We've started that process of looking at new market tax credits. Uh, they could provide up to $3 million uh, for this project. So we're certainly exploring that opportunity and have our fingers crossed. Uh, next page, um, I'm aware of our time, so I hope I'm not going too fast, but we want to keep to our allotted time. Uh, long range financial outlook, you know, we're, we're uh, participating in the next year, uh, the one here, next gen Medicaid, would love to be able to participate in the others, but at this point we just can't take on the risk. Uh, to add Medicare, one care, uh, next gen project would add almost three million dollars of additional risk. And uh, as you've heard, and as I'll repeat, you know we uh, need to book that three million dollars on our income statement as a as a revenue deduction until we know how the actual pro program results, which are you know, 18, 16, 18 months after the year begins. Until that time, we have to work and carry that uh, liability and hit to our income statement. Um, and we also want to do geographic attribution. Right now, uh, we're in the, G the uh, pilot program with DIVA. Uh, we have added almost 6,000 attributed lives through the geographic attribution. So. Our base attribution was about 6,000. Adding the geographic attribution uh, to uh, beneficiaries to that doubles it almost from 6,000 to almost 12,000 round numbers. Um, you've heard about a shrinking balance sheet. Uh, 
uh, expanding our knowledge of total cost of care. We're really starting to understand it, get a handle on it, uh, know what resources to go to to better to drive down, deep, dig deeper into the data. Uh, and Laurel mentioned the one patient who's uh, just the patient's medication costs add $7 per member per month to the total cost of care. Um, so we're really starting to understand that, understanding that the drivers will help us uh, put preventative services and find maybe better ways to, to care and be more efficient to care for the patients in need. Um, collaborative efforts with North Country uh, we've talked about. Um, and so I'll move on to compliance with historical budget orders. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to comply, but uh, we're busy. We're meeting the community needs and we're driving revenue. Um, and we're doing the best we can to, to, to keep within a lot of budgets, but uh, we're not the same hospital we were in 2014. Um, you know, we've added services, we've made access to care, improved, um, added providers, doing what the community is asking us to do. Uh, and doing that is it, it, not been possible to keep within the growth caps that we've uh, been asked to achieve. Uh, we're successful, and, and we think that that's a good thing, but we understand the pressures of trying to, to contain costs of the three and a half percent. Without that cap, and as I've said, the 49 other states, we're, we're doing great. Uh, we're doing great here, but we're, we're struggling to, to live within the, the budget caps that are imposed on us. So, uh, the other thing I would point out is that, you know, the non-financial compliance issues with the compliance with budget orders, uh, we've, we've done and uh, continue to do. So the financial challenges that are facing in the, the three and a half percent of the, the, the issue. So with that, uh, I think we're just about done. Uh, Steve is in our final on but did Sean, I think, does want to make a couple of closing comments. Thank you. So I think, I think what you heard today is that NBRH is a stable and healthy hospital that is poised to continue to meet our community's needs. We enjoy tremendous community support. And uh, despite the fact that our population continues to be older, sicker, and poorer than the rest of the state. You know, I think it's important to recognize that most of our community members have had the same experience and relationship with NBRH that I have had. It's the hospital where my kids were born. It's the hospital where my family receives both acute and preventative care. It's the hospital where, well, my wife is a frequent flyer in the emergency department, but we don't have to get into that. Um, it's, it's where my grandmother received her palliative care, and it's the hospital where I recently lost a loved one due to a heart attack. This hospital is very much a part of the fabric of our community, and it is the economic driver for our region. It's important to recognize that. We really appreciate all of your support. We see the Green Mountain Care Board as both stakeholders and partners, in ensuring our success and our continued ability to meet our, our mission of serving our community. I want to thank again our community partners like NCHC, Northeast Indian Human Services, and the other agencies that help work with us to keep our patients healthy. <clears throat> thank you for the time, and we would appreciate your support of our budget. Thank you, Sean. Um, we're going to take a five minute bio break and uh, resume with the questioning at that point. Okay. Um, I was hoping that you could speak in a little more depth to your emergency department utilization, which seems like it's up significantly from what you had budgeted. Um, I, it sounds like you're doing some work around that with uh, urgent care. Um, so I was also interested if you had a cost impact from shifting that utilization from the ED to the urgent care. So uh, I'd start by saying we're just at the very infant stages of putting that plan together. Um, so we, we haven't really done any, we've made some estimates, um, but not any in-depth cost analysis or, or impact uh, study at this point. Yeah, our ED is, is busy, the volume is up. Uh, 
despite our efforts, you know, we've been working through the uh, chronic care coordinators uh, you know, to, re to make sure that those patients that can avoid going to the ED and see their primary care provider for visits do so. Um, we put re just put recovery coach in the ED to help patients with substance abuse disorders uh, to help you know, prevent those repeat visits. Uh, we've had care managers in the ED uh, working for, I believe, two years, maybe a little bit longer now, uh, for patients to present without a primary care provider to get them into a primary care setting <clears throat> just as, as quickly as possible. And so we're doing this, the steps of doing the right things that we think to, to bring the volume down, but uh, uh, we're still seeing that increase. Uh, and Laura wants to add something. Yeah, so not all ED utilization is due to those, what they call the avoidable ED visits. Um, I just ran or looked at the report of the top ED users last week, and um, the top ED users are the people that I would say uh, fit the characteristics in that category four. Uh, very complex medical, mental health, substance use, social issues. Um, so and those are the types of people and patients that are probably gonna continue to need a lot of resources. Um, hopefully we can find them something that doesn't, um, it helps to avoid keep, so they don't have to go to our ED, but that's gonna take a while. So I just wanna make that point. It's not all the avoid just the avoidable visits. Thank you. I would say that uh, the reason I particularly wanted to ask is because what we're seeing with many of the other hospitals is a drop in ED visits. So, you, so you're a little bit of an outlier in terms of going in the other direction. Yeah. Uh, Michael, did you have something you wanted to add? If I may, I would just say this is an example where Sean and the team have challenged us at the FQAC to think about what we can do. And so other ideas that are also at their infancy are can we do a walk-in primary care clinic and do that with our existing space so we're not investing money in sticks and bricks unnecessarily? Uh, we've thought about expanded hours. We're also thinking about ways to bring the solution to the problem. So in primary care, could we embed in primary care into NKHS, our designated agency? Could we partner with local housing agencies to get space downtown in their buildings? And so we're looking at lots of different ways where we can utilize existing assets to try to address overutilization of potential overutilization of the ED. And, and I would add um, that patients are, have regained confidence in our emergency room. Uh, we have upgraded the providers. We have improved turnaround times uh, in the ED. Uh, patients who used to go to EDs elsewhere are coming back to our facility. Uh, and that has certainly been a factor. <coughs> Oh, and Sean just mentioned uh, there is this uh, bike trail called Kingdom Trails, just a little bit north of us. Incredibly busy, uh, people doing incredible things that I would never try, uh, and some of them do get hurt, and that is also a, a factor we're seeing in our ED, especially this time of year. Thanks. Uh, in terms of the Medicaid pilot, I wanted to to hear what you're thinking about in terms of current or future operational changes uh, to address the movement to more of a fixed payment methodology and uh, looking at, I think Michael alluded to it a little bit, but I wanted to hear more about your operational planning to really shift the way uh, you've been doing business with the new payment model. You want to touch on that, Laurel? So, Robert, are you particularly talking about the you know the pilot to, to test the geographic attribution? Yes. So I guess I wouldn't describe it as that we're changing things. Um, in fact, we most often, when we're talking to our care coordinators or our different community partners, um, it's really the same workflow that we've been putting into place and laying a foundation for for the past 10 years now around the team-based care. There's just an, some additional steps with the Care Navigator, which is the care coordination tool supplied by OneCare. But you know there, there are workflow issues, but there's not dramatic changes. It's just trying to incorporate uh, the, additional, the additional steps for the attributed and the non-attributed population. I mean, one of the things that we keep stressing is we are not just providing this care and care coordination for people who are attributed to the ACO. It's everyone. Um, it's, it was the non-attributed Medicaid patients, Medicare, private payers, it's everyone. 
Um, one of the things that the ACO said to me last year as we were gearing up to joining the ACO is they said, you know, we are going to have to have a plan to take people off the care model if they come off of Medicaid. And I said, no, I'm not. And I said, we're going to continue. They're still our patients. We're going to continue to care for them. We're not, we're not going to get paid for them. <laughs> That's the only thing that's different. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank okay. you. Um, my last question, I think, yeah, no, I think this is my last question. Um, according to the Blueprint practice profiles, uh, the St. Johnsbury area is one of two hosp hospital service areas with the highest relative value use index, meaning that on a risk-adjusted basis, your utilization is higher <coughs> Uh, than other hospitals in the state. Uh, this is a pattern which we've seen repeatedly, I think, in your net patient revenue targets being uh, higher than uh, the guidance, and in this case, this year, asking for twice the guidance, over twice the guidance um, in revenue growth, and that's uh, after we've already rebased your budget in fiscal year 18, we rebased fiscal year 17. So I'm wondering if you've looked at um, doing something like uh, a variation analysis with your physicians to see if there's practice patterns that may be contributing to this. And we know from Dr. Beth Wenberg's work from many, many years ago that practice variation can often drive cost without higher quality as a result. Um, just given the repeated pattern of your utilization and NPR increases, where they've been, I'm wondering if that's something that you would consider doing to see if there are areas where you could be uh, educating physicians in your community that they may be uh, higher uh, prescribers or higher utilize, pushing higher utilization that perhaps is average. So I think the short answer is yes. Um, that data is not always that easy to get. Absolutely. But, um, you know, we just looked at some data yesterday. Norm Ward came over and showed us some ACO data. And, and in some of these areas, there are clearly um, better performers than us in some areas, not just, you know, within our region, but also across the state. And that is one of the things we're going to do is look and see who, who's got these best practices and what can we learn from them. That's welcome because you definitely, you have, you have the community aspect, you know, you're really, like I think, one of the superstars in the state, but we're not seeing it in terms of the total cost of care. And so you're not really getting that return on your investment in a way. So we are, we're definitely looking at total cost of care from many different angles. The, the blueprint information is one, um, the VCARES data is another, and the data we're now getting from one care that Laura alluded to is, is a third. Uh, and we're learning as we go. We've identified, you know, we do have some avoidable ED visits. Uh, I know that this data is from 2017. I know in 2017, one of our primary care practices lost both physicians uh, through retirement who'd been in the community for 25 years. It took us a while to get those replaced, so there was definitely some capacity and access issues that we were dealing with in 2017. Uh, so we continue to look at ways, even though we filled those positions now, looking at ways to reduce avoidable ED visits even today. The data we looked at yesterday, uh, which is the first quarter of 2019, has us right in line with all of the, the one care metrics in terms of total cost of care. So I think we've taken steps. Uh, but we're going to do the point of service ultrasound that Laura alluded to before, the urgent care uh, models that we're putting, or convenient care we're planning to do will all, I think, improve where we are now, which is right in line with other one care system, with one care system. So I, I don't think, I guess the, the short answer too, Robin, I would say is, I don't think right now that that's driving a lot of our revenue growth over the three and a half percent cap. It might be a little bit of a factor, but it's not a material factor, I don't believe at this point. Then what is driving that? Uh, patients coming back, well, patients coming back to us, you know, for years we talked about patients, orthopedic patients coming back, uh, we've now fully staffed with general surgery, fully staffed with all of our specialty practices, uh, all of our primary care practices are full. And so we're providing the services that, that the community needs and, and it's making us busier and that's driving the cost. And I have to also add demographics. You know, we have, as was alluded to earlier, the oldest uh, 
uh, population in, in Vermont. The Northeast Kingdom is the oldest, Vermont is the oldest, and the Northeast Kingdom is the oldest in Vermont. So there's certainly some demographic issues as well. Maybe now's a good time for me to show one of my exhibits I brought. Um, I hope you guys, maybe now's a good time for me to show one of the exhibits I brought. Um, I hope you'll indulge me for a minute, but I, I know that Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital is not um, the only order hospital in the state of Vermont, and there are several of us, but I think it is uh, good to illustrate just uh, what um, our community experiences and what we see and what we deal with on a daily basis. So. Uh, we have a local paper. We're blessed to still have a daily. It's the Caledonia Record. And uh, I brought, uh, actually I got two separate ads, but this is an example of what um, Littleton Regional Hospital huh? yeah, we'll up. Um, um, puts in the Caledonia Record on a relatively regular basis. This is a full page ad for their services. And I know um, I've had friends who've traditionally bypassed NDRH and gone to Littleton for their ortho care, for their regular care, um, because of perception or whatever. And the positive is, in the last four or five years, that perception's changing. And those people who have been spending Vermont dollars in New Hampshire are now spending Vermont dollars in our own community. And that's incredibly important, and I think that is part of that story despite the fact that Littleton Regional Hospital does a heck of a lot more advertising in our own market than we do. Well, certainly if you have data around in patients coming back to St. James, we would love to see that. Yeah, we're trying, trying to get it. We're trying to get it. Yeah, it's, it's hard difficult to get and not timely. Yeah. And if you would know of any way to get it, please let us know. <laughs> we're trying. But some hospitals <laughs> seem to be able to get out of their EMR, but that does uh, vary based on EMR. Well, that doesn't help with the leakage that, you know, what went out and what is now coming back. So, Robin, you asked such good questions that uh, both Jess and I wanted to follow up. Please. <laughs> but, so, Jess, I'll go to you. No, go ahead. Um, so, Robin's concerns are similar to mine, um, not surprisingly, probably. Particularly, so I'm encouraged about the total cost of care. Actually, let me back up for a second because I didn't think I was going to go second. So my other thought, I just want to say thank you to you because I think it's incredibly helpful to learn about your community and a lot of the hospital initiatives that you're taking to improve population health and economic growth in your area. I mean, it's, these are helpful budget hearings to learn about what's happening. Um, and I just want to echo and not really too much emphasize other than to say I agree wholeheartedly with some of Robin's observations about the total cost of care and I'm encouraged that you're looking at your total cost of care. Um, you know, in the, in the measures that we provided in our budget guidance, you know, your St. John's Bay area was slightly above the state median, but it was growing at a faster rate than the 3.5, right? It was growing at 4.2 uh, according to that. That's not risk adjusted and it's not limited to care you know, at your hospital, it's a resident analysis. But the blueprint is another interesting way to take a slice at it. And again, I recognize it's 2017, and so I'm, I'm encouraged to see the new updated uh, data that I think the blueprint will be coming out with this fall. So hopefully we'll see some progress there. But St. Johnsbury is the fourth highest per capita spend in the state in 2017, and that's risk adjusted. So that helps us understand even apples to apples, after we risk adjust, the spend there is high. And where it was high was in inpatient surgery, ED, as you mentioned, outpatient surgery, radiology, pharmacy at the hospital. And I think the worrisome piece to me is, is the resource use. So that's the second highest in the state. And again, that was risk adjusted. So I, I echo the, the you know, initiative to do some variation analysis and to try and look at provider parent patterns. I think that's really important to see if some of that is driving some of that cost. Uh, the ED visits is, is a worrisome thing for me too. And I was gonna bring this up, but um, for two reasons. One is you were high on risk adjusted, just regular ED visits, also high on avoidable ED visits, but just <clears throat> avoidable and unavoidable ED visits, uh, St. John's Bury was high. And I'm worried because you're up 12% budget to budget on ED visits. As Robin was saying, most hospitals are seeing a decline. So even if we look at that's 2017 data, you're still growing in your ED visits. That's not changing despite some of the initiatives that you're taking on. So I'm wondering a couple of things. One of the things you're budgeting for an additional 1,000 visits over 2019 projected for 2020. 
that seems high. You also were budgeting 1,000 visits in your urgent care, right? I think there was some narrative there. And I'm wondering, is that the same 1,000 visits? Yes. Okay. If it is, what is the cost reduction assumed on those 1,000 visits, assuming that it's not going to cost as much? And is that also budgeted in? Is it just, did you load up the ED visits? Did you also reduce the, the revenue assumption that would be, those are of, now not going to be taking place in the ER. They're going to be taking place in a convenient care center, urgent care center at a lower cost. So how is that all baked in there? It, um, it's all baked in there at our best estimate, our best estimate of what the cost is going to be. and what. So what is the cost avoidance per visit then estimated to be? Uh, we, we didn't. I, I don't have that with me, uh, Jessica. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's a little, I, was, I guess I'd start by saying in the first year, probably not a lot, because it's going to take a while to people to, in the community to understand what the program is. And, how to access it and even know that it's there. I mean, we can do full-page ads like Littleton to help make them aware. Uh, but it's going to take time for the community to adjust uh, and to change patient habits. You know, they used to go into the ED. Changing that habit is, is going to take some time. So the, the initial cost per visit is probably going to be higher than it will be you know, down the road after the community starts getting used to going there. And, and the cost per visit will go down because they're using that service more than the ED. OK. Um, and you're thinking about expanding your ED. So there's an expansion, right, yep. proposed for your ED. So I'm wondering, as you're making the changes that it sounds like you're making at the FQHC and also in the, in the sure. um, convenient, are you factoring in the presumed hopeful reduction in ED visits? in your proposed expansion of your ED? Yes. Um, the how visits how that, are you doing that? Well, the visits that are not going to be coming to the ED are those, you know, level fives, they call them. You know, the, the ear waxes that they need to get blown out and the, the scratchy throat that needs to be seen. I mean, those aren't our resource-intensive visits that I'll be going to. And they're not the ones that take a lot of time in the ED. The turnaround time for those patients is very low. You know, we're building the ED. Again, I'll start by saying, you know, 2,200 square feet short just by today's standards. And we're building it for those higher acuity patients, including those patients with mental illness that are going to take a lot more resources, require a lot more space uh, in, in, in staffing. Um, so yes, we may be losing some of the, the level fives, but you know, that's not why we're doing the project. Okay. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the NPR growth. And there's two, uh, seems to me, two rationales for it. One is increased demand. And to the extent that you're clawing back from Littleton or New Hampshire and there's more renewed confidence in the hospital, do you have a sense from other hospitals that are seeing increased demand, we're seeing data on unique patient visits? Do you have similar data on actually unique patients that are coming into your hospital over time? Unique patients. Yeah, patients. unique patients. So you're really looking at individuals. Oh, individuals, gotcha. Yeah, 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 yeah. non-duplicated visits. Yeah. Uh, unique, uh, How many unique individuals have, are showing up at your hospital right. over time? Right, can yes. You we, show, can you do that assessment for us, we, analysis, so we can? We can, I okay. believe. Uh, we're still learning how to New EMR. use our EMR very efficiently and get all the data out of it that's in there. But yes, we'll, we'll make That'd it That'd be really helpful. Yeah. Um, and related to that, you talked about your acuity increasing to the extent that you've got an aging population. Mm -hmm. Do you have similar data on your case mix index over time? So as a matter of fact, we just got something that I think it's okay for me to say that uh, the hospital association put together that I think you're going to receive today <clears throat> that showed our case mix index increasing from 2015, I believe, from an index of 1.18 to 2019, it's 1.3. So we're talking roughly 10, 11 percent increase okay. in acuity. That's right. And we're going to get that today, you uh, said? Or? <laughs> well, if you could share it with us, what you've seen. I, that's what we, the data showed for us. It, it may not be ready for prime time, so I hope I'm not speaking at the term <laughs> here yet. But uh, I know the Hospital Association is working on providing you with that data. Okay. That's very helpful. Um, I'm trying to get a sense of relative pricing. So if on average Medicare reimburses $100 for a service, what would your commercial payers on average reimburse? Uh, as a percent of charges? If, if it's $100 for a Medicare service, what on average? Oh, oh would gotcha. Your commercial uh, so commercial is probably. No. Can, can you just finish the whole question? Yes. If it's, $100. If, if it's $100 for a Medicare service, okay. that same service reimbursed by a commercial payer would cost on average what? would be reimbursed. So for the $100 that Medicare pays, a commercial will probably pay $175, okay. maybe in that ballpark. I could, I could do a better calculation, but Thank you. off the top of my head, that's about what it would be. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and 
after the budgets were submitted, we're hearing from some hospitals that Medicaid gave notice that there may be some rate, small rate adjustments, increases. Have you factored that in or estimated what that might be for NBRH? Uh, no, I have not. Or did been, you even receive it? I, I was going to say, I have, some not hospitals seen, may not have. I have not seen anything from okay. Divas saying that we're going to get a Medicaid increase in, okay. in some We would welcome one. I, yeah. <laughs> so the, none has been factored into the budget. Okay. And you haven't received any notice that suggests otherwise. Okay. No. Uh, and we're the year started, so. Perfect. And I think my last question is to make sure my glasses on. My last question is around, I, I see a lot of wonderful collaboration within your community. That's really inspiring. Um, one of the things that we've noticed is the hospitals that tend to be doing the best financially, and also I think providing high quality care, are those that are collaborating with other hospitals to share services, save economy to scale, increase access to their patient population through shared services. And I hear from you, you know, this uh, collaboration with Dartmouth Hitchcock around the cardiac and uh, with North Country around the sleep center. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about other proposed collaborations that might potentially reduce costs, increase access, and maybe even perhaps talk about telemedicine if that's a, an opportunity for you to bring more services into your community. Sure. If you talk a little about that, that'd be great. Yeah, um, so I'll build on some things we've already shared. You, you've highlighted a few. Um, I'll come back to where we've started a conversation with North Country Hospital on how we partner on occupational um, health um, and expanding those services throughout the Northeast Kingdom. Uh, the cardiology service, it's, it's, it's not only is it a partnership with Dartmouth, but Dartmouth is placing the cardiologist or has at North Country Hospital as well as Littleton Regional. So for, creates a pool of professionals within our region who will be working together under the same network and then affiliate with Dartmouth at the same time. So that's, that's a real strength. We have uh, been exploring a lot of telehealth solutions within the hospital and how we leverage some of those, um, those um, um, solutions. Dartmouth has some really compelling options that we're considering. Uh, one is around uh, access to telepsych and teleneuro that would help, especially our emergency services team, provide um, care in a, on an emergent basis. Um, some of the services are very expensive and it's hard to uh, um, find an ROI to justify them, but those services in particular, the way Dartmouth has structured them, seem uh, attractive because there is a pay as you use them or pay as you need them type, type feature. We're continuing to explore all the options. Um, I, I'm going to touch base. I want to pull it back a little bit and talk about some of the opportunities that the ACO also gives us. Because once you de-link uh, how we're being paid from the act of showing up at an office, it, it, we're early days in this, but it gives us a lot of opportunity to consider how we provide care to people um, on an ongoing basis. You know, you do a lot over the telephone. You know an awful lot over the telephone. And, and we don't think of that as telehealth, but it kind of is, right? And so we're trying to figure that out. I think maybe next year we'll be able to tell a better story around that. Um, we're also um, talking to North Country Hospital about how we cross-train nursing staff, especially in our Bergen Center. Um, you know, it's, it's no surprise. You, know, you guys have heard it, Bergen Centers are tough. Um, but we've got a great birthing center. We need a birthing center to be there for a lot of really important reasons. Number one, it's an important, um, it's an important service to provide our community. Number two, we know we have an aging population where we're struggling to attract young people. One of the single most worst things you can do um, if you're trying to attract young people to the communi community is close your birthing center. Because where are people gonna have their babies, right? So, so it's an important asset for the entire community. Uh, North Country is an important asset for them too. And so how do we, knowing that our birth rate's declining, how do we ensure that our staff are highly trained and how do we ensure that those services are available in our communities? So that's a great opportunity where we're trying to figure out how best to collaborate and maybe even long-term share resources between our organizations. That's great to hear because I worry too about as our population is declining, we want to ensure access, but we want to ensure access with a certain level of quality and yeah. volume and, 
and quality can be correlated with some yeah. procedures and surgeries. So. You, you know, when it comes to collaboration, relationships matter. And, and I gotta say, you know, I mean, I know we, we've lost our math in a copley and they're going through leadership change, but we had, a, I always had a strong relationship with art. Um, same thing, Brian and I, we probably communicate at least once a week. Like, I, mean, I just got an email from him the other day. Um, they're recruiting a special, I forget what it is, they're recruiting a specialist from, but the, but the specialist partner is a urologist. So he forwarded me an email and said, hey, where are you guys at with urology? Do you need one? How can we work together to recruit two professionals to our region, right? And, and those are those relationships matter. Having, having that, being able to work together on that type of thing is really important. That's very encouraging. Um, one, I realize I have one final question. Bob, you were talking about you're fully staffed, and some of the reasons now that you're getting this increased revenue is that you, you're fully staffed in some of the areas that you were not staffed before. Does any of the increased uh, net patient revenue qualify under our provider acquisition? Are these services that they were already receiving in the community, but now? They're, they're coming in under employed physicians, or is there any world in which this is, uh, can qualify under any of our carve-outs for that? No, no, unfortunately, other than the physical therapy practice, okay. uh, they're all existing practices that we've had that just had been short-staffed uh, without enough providers and being fully staffed. Okay, okay, thank you. Robin, did you have further questions? No. Okay, Tom. <clears throat> Well, thank you uh, for your kind of very broad presentation. It certainly offers a very good feel for, um, you know, for, for your hospital. I, I empathize with Sean when I'm down visiting Southwest the Hospital, which to me is Putnam Hospital. You always wonder which room you were born in uh, <laughs> as you go through this, these older age <laughs> facilities. Uh, my first question is, um, having to do with the uh, contractual allowances in, in, in Medicare that you project. Uh, Medicare, I think, is more than half of the uh, NPR that you're looking for in 2020 over 2019. And I was just kind of did a calculation on the um, contractual allowances as a percentage of gross patient revenue uh, in the recent past. And for uh, 2016, it was 59.7%, 2017 at 59.6%, uh, 2018 at 56.6%, and um, 2019 so far projected at 57.9%, but the percentage uh, projection for 2020 is 55.7%, which is, which is lower than any of the observed rates. And I'm, I'm wondering about that because if, if the, contract allowance actually just rose back up to where it was now in 2019, um, that would be a 1.7 million differential, which basically wipes out your um, operating margin. So I'm just wondering, do you feel that any risk about the, the um, relatively historically low contract allowance amount associated with Medicare in 2020? Uh, no, I'm confident that those are the right numbers. Um, as I mentioned during the presentation, you know, our Medicare reimbursement is tied to our cost. And as our cost changes, our Medicare reimbursement changes. So we take, you know, our, the formula that we used to estimate it and um, the, the increase in cost in addition to this current year's projected Medicare is what we determine to be the net revenue. And the difference between what we bill and that net revenue is the contractual. So um, I, I didn't do the analysis that you did, but I'm confident that what we're projecting for net revenue for Medicare, and therefore the contractuals are accurate. Thank you. Um, my next question has to do with um, uh, the provider tax and, the, and we and, and DISH in that relationship that, uh, um, uh, as you know, the provider tax is kind of going up with volume over time and DISH is going down because of some um, ACA uh, um, um, concerns, I think, mostly. And what, what I see is um, a large trend statewide that that Delta is growing since 2017. It's about a $30 million hit to hospitals collectively, their bottom line, you know, as their uh, costs go up with the provider tax and their revenue goes down with the dish. And for uh, you folks, um, it would be a, um, you're, you're projecting 
uh, provider tax moving from 4.3 million to 5.1 million in dish payments, dropping even uh, from 1.6 million in 2017 to 987,000, which is a slight increase, but it's not offsetting uh, you know, the change in the provider tax. And I'm just wondering if, given who your legislative delegation is, uh, that family kind of controls the state budget, um, Jane and, and Kitty, have you had conversations with them about this? Because it is, I mean, uh, during your presentation you were talking about savings and ACO and um, efficiencies and things of that sort, and I worry that these other kinds of wins in your face, like the relationship between the provider tax and the dish payment, are kind of sapping that energy um, out of the efforts that you're putting in. It is a challenge, uh, just in numbers. Our, the difference between our Medicaid, the provider tax and our dish reimbursement is $4 million. We pay $4 million more in tax than we get in the dish revenue. Okay, so, yes, we had extensive discussions with our legislators, particularly back when they took the money, the dish money from hospitals and moved it to shore up the uh, mental health services in the community. Made them well aware of the challenges that that was going to present. So, the short answer is yes. I just think it's important the scale of it because that number, too, kind of like the Medicare number I was referencing, is pretty close to your operating margin. And uh, so, on the scale of things, these are not uh, small little corners of the world. They're, um, uh, they're, they're significant. It is significant. It's a $4 million cost shift. Right, right. Um, just a question on your mountain biking and hiking injuries. Um, my simple mind says that uh, those people might be younger uh, than, than, I mean, you're not out there doing it, neither am I. You're saying old? <laughs> <laughs> How do you know uh, Bob doesn't train every day on his bike? Uh, pardon me? How do you know Bob's not training every he day on his so. bike? <laughs> <laughs> I did. I said Dick Crazy doing that. <laughs> I went to Bible with all the respect. Maybe I'm doing bike. I don't know. Um, so, but I'm just wondering if, uh, and, and that these folks might be more out of state, and I'm just wondering in terms of payment for services in the emergency room, um, do they fit the average profile, or are they folks that um, either young and don't have insurance or out of staters and it's, is, is there a, an issue there maybe? Uh, there hasn't been, no. we've been successful. Um, the younger, they bounce back quicker so they don't require a lot of the extensive resources that somebody like me, for example, if I get injured. Um, but we do get paid. I will tell you that a lot of them come down from Canada. It's a huge attraction from people from Canada and we are able to work with the Canadian system and get paid for, for those as well as uh, other, other staters in, in the United States as well. Can I just follow up on that one? Sure. What uh, percentage of reimbursement are you getting from the Canadian system? Yeah, it's good. I don't have it with me, but I, I, recollection is it's like 75% of charges, roughly. It's almost as good as the commercial payers. Super. Sorry, Tom. No, go. Oh, oh, more. More. Um, and just uh, while I'm thinking about it, a, a quick follow-up to one of Jess's questions. If, uh, if uh, Medicare is paying you 100 bucks for a procedure or for service, and uh, the commercial is paying you 175, what is Medicaid paying you? Uh, Medicaid would be paying us roughly uh, 70 to 75. Of again. Medicare. Of the 100 Medicare right. payment, right. right. Again, um, it's off the top of my head. Is, so you, you mentioned that there's some delay in capturing in, in 2019 some 340B revenue, um, estimated about $450,000. Um, and I'm looking at then rolling into 2020. Is any of that recovery embedded in your 2020 estimate? It is. So some of it, um, I just sort of put a little footnote there that tried to oversimplify it a bit. So part of it was we didn't get as much as we anticipated. And part of it was the transition was the Walgreens system took over some of the uh, local 340B uh, Rite Aid pharmacies, and we had a little hiccup there that it took a while to discover. Uh, so some of it was a timing issue, and some of it was just an over budget. The timing issue uh, has been is being resolved and has been built into our 2020 budget. And two final questions that are relating to bad debt. The first is um, in 2017-2018, uh, <coughs> the total amount of bad debt that uh, that you recognized was around $4 million, uh, and only 457 according to that appendix that you submitted to us, was put into collections. 
and resulting from collections was uh, $84,000 in recovery, or an 18% rate. And that's about the average rate that we saw on those appendixes, and I fully admit that it's not a, you know, an audited financial approach, but it gives us some uh, information. And I'm just wondering why more of your bad debt doesn't go to collections. Uh, well, we send everything to, to collections that we think is going to be collectible. Um, and we go through a, a process for everybody. I'm, I don't have the table in front of me, but uh, I will say we work all of our accounts in, in house very hard. So if we turn an account over to collection, it's pretty much dead. And that's why our, I don't know what the other hospitals are, that's why our collection return recovery rate is low, because um, we, we work them hard. We, the recoveries, I'll tell you, are mostly that people, the, the credit score has been impacted by going to collection. And when it's need, they need to access credit, they then pay the bill. So other than that, uh, accounts are pretty much dead by the time we send them and the recovery rates are low. And maybe Mike can offer some uh, insight on this uh, going back to your tax reform days. The um, state has a program called the Offset Program in the Tax Department where they intercept you know, people's income tax refunds uh, if they have a, a debt owed to the state. And, you know, this is a program that's well-established, well-organized, uh, very um, uh, sensitive to uh, um, uh, uh, people's rights of appeal and things of that sort. And it's used by BSAC and uh, the Defender General, the State Collar System, the Child Support over at AHS. And um, it's, it's, uh, I'm just wondering if the state opened its doors um, to that program, um, uh, would, would you be interested in the option, not the mandate, but the option to place some of your bad debt um, in that program uh, to uh, recover some revenues? I think that's a very good question for the Hospital Association and the state legislature, not for the CEO of an FQHC. So I'm going to politely decline. Um, to, to offer any opinion on that. Okay, Maureen. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, I really want to applaud the fact that you guys have been able to maintain a you know fairly healthy operating margin for the past five years, and you're really about one of the only critical access hospitals that has been able to do that. That's that's not an affiliated hospital. So I. I I think that's great news and we want to keep it there. One of the concerns that I have over the past couple of years, um, 2019, 2018, you've been exceeding your top line in your NPR, but your expenses have exceeded even the growth of your top line. And typically we see the opposite of this. Most of the struggling hospitals are missing their top line. They have fixed costs and so their costs are not able to come down by the amount that their revenue is, is also going down. And so it creates kind of a, a spiral situation. You guys are really in the opposite of that. You keep exceeding your numbers, and you know, we've gone through some of the rationale of why that's happening. Um, but you, you, you absolutely maintain almost to the dollar your operating income that you were targeting. And you know, it seems to me this should be really an opportunity where you're leveraging those fixed costs because you're not always potentially going to be in the situation where you have that flexibility. So just wanted to talk a little bit about why that continues to happen and why you aren't able to leverage some of those fixed costs and, and generate some additional bottom line income on the top line that you continue to beat. Uh, sure. Um, I guess I'll start by saying we're constantly looking at expenses to make sure that we're saving and reducing and not adding wherever possible. Um, I'll also say that you know we have a lot of fixed expenses, but uh, when you have to pay $3.2 million for temporary staffing, um, that's a huge increase, that, you know, a huge expense driver. So our revenue is going up because our volume is going up. We need to staff the departments. Uh, appropriately, again, to maintain safety for the patients uh, and the staff. In order to do that, we need to provide staffing. If we can't do it on our own, we have to add staff. And that's what we're doing with the temporary agency expenses. So uh, we we'll hope to replace some of that expense with our own employed staff. 
Um, but you know, the fixed costs are there. What we're adding is staff to handle the additional volume uh, and an additional premium when we're talking about the locum. And then we have just the general inflation going up for healthcare going up higher than overall inflation. You know, our drug costs, as I mentioned, the increase there. We're doing whatever we can to, to maximize the 340B savings, but the drug cost increases are real. That's, that's just one example. So uh, I hear your concern. It, it's a, certainly appropriate. It's my concern you know, every single day, and we're doing the best we can to, to reduce costs and only spend what we absolutely have to. Yeah, because I would hope that we would get some of that leverage eventually in the future years. And yeah. Because the other, other thing, and I'm not going to try to minimize that you're not looking for cost savings, but you know the hospitals that are, are having trouble, I mean, we actually have kind of the tale of two cities today between Northeastern and Northwestern, you know, the list of cost savings, of, you know, programs that they're working on aggressively are significant and, and a much larger percentage. And, you know, that's been one of the things I think you know I've been focusing on the past several years is you know how do we get some waste out of the system how do we optimize these cost savings you know without doing anything for quality of care and when you're in a situation where you keep raising the top line each year you know it's it's there's less need maybe to have to really go after every single dollar that you can on a cost savings and you know I'd really like you to give some more documentation on all the cost savings and efficiencies that you're putting in and maybe how you can leverage what some of the other hospitals are doing um, as well so again I'm not saying you're not doing it it's just you know there's a different drive if you're if you're you know top lines going down yeah. if you've got these fixed costs and you're able to do it and there's a lot more room in a hospital that's growing double what the expectations that we've put forward and you know, just want to talk a little bit about, convince me that your cost savings are, that I'll you're be happy driving. To, I'll be happy to put that together for you. Okay. Um, just want to talk a little bit about the ACO um, risk and the reserves and, um, you know, we, we see various positions from each of the hospitals as they come in for that. And I understand, you know, auditors may be saying you need 100% and we're not going to change that. Um, but when you start to look at the compounding of that, so you have 100% booked for 19 and then you'll have 100% booked for 20, and we would hope that the likelihood that you'll actually you know, hit 100% max downside risk year over year. So it, at some point, and I know you'll end up getting a resolution you know, of, of 19 potentially sometime in, in 20, you know, how should we think about that? Because particularly in your case, um, you know, that's about, you know, I'll be blunt, half of what your commercial rate increase is year over year. So even though, of course, it's not saying it's contributing to commercial rate, but the way you put your P&L together, you look for a bottom line 2%, you know, there's things that get put, plugged in, if you will. And, you know, I just would say, for you guys, it might actually be you're being a little bit too conservative with that. And if, in fact, you have to book that whole thing, what's going to happen then when some comes back favorably, as we hope it does, right? Because the swing could be, you know, 100% the other way, right? If, if you look at it, some hospitals are saying the number we get is straight up the middle. There should be as much risk upside as downside, and so we're not booking anything. And, and that's difficult for, you know, a hospital your size. But booking 100% when it could swing 100% the other way just want to kind of set up that you know there will be expectations that you know how, how do you handle that in your P&L? Yeah, um, I, I think I can answer this somewhat simply. Um, you know, hopefully this is a one-time buildup that we've got enough reserves so that in the future you know, results are favorable and we don't have to add anything going forward. So in the other case, if we get money back, then the reserve will come down and that'll be a pickup to our uh, net operating patient revenue. Okay, I just want to go through a few questions on um, page six of your um, documentation on um, what some of the changes have been from your budget to your projection. Um, you talk about the reference lab work, and that's up about a million dollars in your revenue side. 
And just wanted to get, what's the net impact of that? So how much of expenses were there on the expense side related to that? So that is the net, the incremental expenses. So it was about 350,000 of the additional expenses associated with the additional re uh, revenue. Okay. But that, that is netted already in that number. Right, so to me, that's another example of, you went from a million to 2.1 million. So you had a million dollars of net that just dropped that that one thing is dropping to the bottom line, right? So, uh, well, no, actually, it's dropping from net patient revenue to oper other operating revenue. So the total operating revenue number didn't change. It's just a shift from the net patient revenue to the other operating revenue. So that's what I'm trying to ask. So that yeah. so you change this from budget from a million forty nine to two one five seven. So you went up a million dollars. Where did that million dollars come from? From other net patient revenue. So okay. net patient revenue would have been a million dollars higher if we didn't make that change. Would have been a million higher even, so in your budget. Okay. And then going down to, because I think you answered this in questions, but it seems to be different on here. So your fringe benefits went up from 8.8 .8 million to 10.9 million, and your MD fringe benefits 2.6 to 3.1. But then you said there was a fiscal 2019 reporting error, so I, I corrected that statement. It was not a reporting error. Okay, but that's still on your documents that okay. you just okay. submitted. So I just wanted to. Uh, thank you. I will change that. Because I changed it with the staff. I let the, the staff know about it, but I guess I did not change it. Okay, so that wasn't a reporting error. So the increase, so the, the big <clears throat> increase you had in your other expense categories was really, you know, these salaries and French. So I'm sorry, there's, I'm sorry, there's two different things. I, I know what you're talking about now. It's the 1.6 when we put the budget together uh, was an error. It was another uh, non-salary expenses and it should have been infringed. So that, that was a $1.6 million error. Okay. I was thinking of something else. That the, and the fringes change, year to year they change. Okay, and then just one last, on your non-operating revenue, and I understand you don't budget for non-operating revenue because we don't obviously know what the market's going to do and that a lot of this, that, but in your 2019 projection now, what would you say you're going to pick up or lose in non-operating revenue? Because you still have it as a zero, but we're, you know, six months through the year from here and, you know, 10, 11 months through the year. So, I, I, again, I would be hesitant to even predict what the stock market is going to do between now and September 30th. So I, I like still today. say zero. Right. Well, you, um, today, I, I think we still have uh, a loss in our investments okay. year to date. So right now, it would be a negative number. You'd have a loss. Okay. Um, I guess just one final question. When, when we look at where you've been historically for NPR, so you've grown 5.9 and 15, 9.2 and 16, 7.3 and 17, 2.1 and 18, 7.7 and 19, and now from 19 to 20 against your projection is three and a half. So, you know, we don't want to be back here again next year with you exceeding your budget. You know, how, how are you going to stick to three and a half when you're coming off a year of over seven? Uh, we're going to do our best to stick to the three and a half. Um, I want to say, I, we're not going to turn patients away. If patients come and need services, we need to take care of them. Yeah, okay. I, I think part of what we've been asking, too, and maybe you can get back to us, is, you know, some of this, if it's the unique patients or, you know, people yeah. coming back to Vermont or from out of state, you know, it helps understand, you know, um, their growth year over year, yeah. each year. So that would be helpful. We will do that. Okay, thank you. Sure. So just to uh, follow up on that, Bob, is there any way that you could uh, get information on what the revenues have looked like from year to year at Littleton? Well, we've taken back from New Hampshire hospitals. Well, if, you, if you're gaining people back, they should be losing. So the question is, can you provide the board with any historical information about what the revenues have been at the Littleton Hospital? We can re-estimate, right? I put together, I think, last year or the year before, an estimate of what we thought it was. But uh, it can only be an estimate. We don't have access to 
uh, revenue that Littleton Hospital saw from St. John's Street. We can only make our best estimates of what that number is. Okay. I mean, clearly what, what you're hearing from this board is if you're bringing business back, that's a very good thing, mm -hmm. but there's got to be some way to document it. And so, as I think one of the other board members mentioned earlier, um, other hospitals have been able with their own software to document it. So Bennington was able to show um, the dollars coming in from Massachusetts with the closure of North Adams Hospital and the dollars coming in from New York with the um, closure of the Glens Falls Hospital Clinic there. Right. And You're right. Sorry. What was that, you, Bob? Oh, I wasn't sure you would ask the question. I, I wasn't, but go ahead. Well, I, <laughs> it, it's hard for us. I mean, those patients that were getting services from St. Johnsbury in New Hampshire, um, you know, we're New Hampshire residents. New Hampshire, I mean, uh, we're Vermont residents with Vermont zip code. So now they're in our system getting services in our EHR with Vermont zip code. So we can't tell from that analysis who had been going to Littleton and is now coming back to St. Johnsbury. Okay. Um, I, I'm not going to beat that dead horse any longer, but you Well, I would just say that my understanding yeah. is that the VQR's data can help with some of that analysis, but it, it's a little dated and it does not include some revenue sources like any of the ERISA revenues. I mean, yeah. we can use that as sort of a, a rough estimate, but it, it's not complete. Yeah, can I just... Okay. Yeah, another way of putting it, Kevin, is um, we don't consider New Hampshire our service area. We don't try to pull people from New Hampshire to our area. Littleton has a, they think exactly opposite. They, they strongly market. Um, I live in Danville, Vermont. I get, you know, through my mail, postal you know, advertisement for their stuff all the time. So that's why it's hard to quantify. We're just trying to keep people who live in our area at our hospital. They're trying to pull people over. We don't, we don't do that. Yeah, I will say we do not pull a lot of New Hampshire business into, into our hospital. It's people that were in Vermont coming back to Vermont. But I, I, we can do an analysis of what revenue we have from New Hampshire Hospital, New Hampshire residents, that would be helpful. Well, only if there's been a change. And, right. And that's, yeah. that's the key. We, we don't think there's been a significant change in, in that direction. I mean, it, it's just that every year you come forward and you always make a very compelling case and you do a really good job in your presentation but you have grown faster than your peers and you're in an area of the state that has not seen population growth like other areas um, so it's just it's a it's a tough thing to you know the board has to be fair as they treat all 14 hospitals and um, so I'll leave that one at that. I, I think you did a great job, Bob, on explaining the um, change in charges, but I just want to clarify and make sure that I understand completely because um, I believe that what you were saying that um, other than physician practices, it was 3.8% across uh, the other hospital service areas. And I just wanted to um, know if that 3.8% was consistently applied across other, other service areas or whether ups and downs? Uh, that will be consistent across all areas. Great. With one exception, I will say uh, MRI will not go up because that was a condition of our CO1 approval. Right. And then on the provider transfer um, adjustment that you're seeking for the um, PT practice that uh, you acquired, um, are you using as the base number what the revenues were for were from that practice previously, or are you using as a base a number that you have projected? Uh, we use the number we projected. So, as you know, we um, are trying to contain overall cost growth in the system, and for it to really be uh, a fair addition to your NPR. It would be more helpful if we knew what that number was previously. Oh, okay. It, it was not significantly different. Okay. Yeah. No, it, was, it was our projection, but it was based on a lot of the data that they gave us, and we didn't change it significantly. Okay. That, that's helpful. I, I think that's all the questions that I had. Um, so I'm going to staff any further questions from you? No further questions. Um, I'm going to turn it over to the health care advocate. Thanks. 
Thanks. <laughs> I didn't want to be that one. We can observe. Um, maybe I'll just start by, by admitting that I'm one of those people who, those crazy people, I don't know that I'm young. I come to your area and I'm like, and it is a phenomenal well, I, I, I didn't scene. Mean, I didn't mean to offend you. <laughs> it's a phenomenal scene of people. Yes, a lot of Canadians and a lot of people come and uh, enjoy the outdoors. And, it's great. It's a great thing. I'm kind of jealous, but I just, you know, I'm old. Um, so, as you know, we've been focusing some on the bad debt free care numbers. And um, from our perspective, for the uh, uh, for most part, um, uh, your story about bad debt free care is um, You know, you. Uh, in the sort of strict comparison of bad debt and free care, um, you're about one to one, which puts you in the top tier uh, of hospitals that are uh, have a, a higher amount of free care in comparison to your bad debt. But I'll dig just a little bit deeper on your numbers because it tells a bit of an interesting story, and that is that um, as a percent of net patient revenue, um, your bad debt is pretty much in the middle of the pack of hospitals. Um, three point eight percent, um, but your free care as a percent of net patient revenue is really high. You're you're doing a better job of um, helping people get free care than uh, all but one other hospital. And so I, I say that just to, to lead up to the question, um, I don't know what it is uh, that makes it your experience with um, making sure uh, people in your community have access to your free care program, um, uh, but I would welcome any, any thoughts about what it is that you're doing on the ground that, um, you know, wh whether it's making it, uh, make sure people know about it or helping people complete their applications uh, both. I mean, we do try and make everybody aware of the program. Uh, all of our physician practices, our VD, our access department, it's posted everywhere in those areas that they have access to free care. Uh, all the billing statements that go out, it's referenced. You know, if you feel you need patient assistance, please call. Uh, we have a dedicated person who's great at her job, uh, making sure that patients fill out the application uh, completely and accurately so that they can get qualified. Uh, if they meet the criteria. Um, and I think our program is pretty good. You can be uh, a family of four making $103,000 and still get a 47% discount. So I think our program is a, is a good program as well. Yeah, I also think we've done a really good job of educating our staff. So if there's any sense that when they're interacting with patients, that there's any concern about the bill, they are very well versed in our uh, patient assistance program and know where to, to help navigate them to the right people. So, and then maybe my, and then I think my last question is, um, um, well, maybe I have two more, but um, you, you report that your free care is, um, is, is about $3 million, a little bit under $3 million, and it's um, about 1,200 people who receive Free care, free care, and um, I, I guess I I don't expect you to have an answer on this, but it's something I'm curious about whether you, you'd be able to get an answer. Um, again, a little bit over three million dollars for your for your bad debt. Um, would you have a way of backing into knowing uh, how many uh, patients that is that get free care? Uh, that get the bad debt. Oh, they get the bad debt. Um, I would say yes. We could get it. Uh, I don't have it handy, um, but I'm pretty certain I can get a very good estimate, if not a more exact one. So um, all of the hospitals are very quick to remind me uh, that the doors are open and that people get care uh, even when they have um, bad debt. But, um, but I did want to ask if you could uh, just, uh, you've done a very good job of putting a human face on um, um, the experience of people coming to you and the human face on the way that you've been able to help populations. Um, I, I would welcome any thoughts you have about that, uh, that population of people uh, who have received some care in, in this case in 2018, um, and who carry a debt uh, uh, as an outcome of that care. 
And what happens to their ability, uh, um, ability to come in the door, or the likelihood of coming in the door, or whether there's any, I, I don't know, any, any thoughts you have about that population of people? I don't believe that any of them feel any hesitancy to use our services if they need them, if they have a bad debt or not. You know, we, we do everything we can to collect a bad debt. We don't go overboard. Our collection agency that we use follows all the, the HFMA uh, patient-friendly billing guidelines. Um, you know, we do not threaten people or intimidate people in any way that would prevent them from coming in any time they needed a service. Yeah, can I add um, the other thing that I've often wondered about, and because I don't have these numbers, and maybe after today I'll try to find them, uh, but I feel like we do a really good job of connecting people to Medicaid and other health insurance through the Vermont um, Healthy Connection. I, I don't know if we do better than you know how we compare to the state. But we're, we're very aggressive about doing that, and we have uh, lots of resources to help people. Yeah, our, our free care policy requires that they apply for Medicaid first. So uh, thank you, and uh, I look forward to um, uh, continued conversations with people from the board and from the hospital association about the system uh, uh, statewide, and um, uh, just about the sort of the number of Vermonters that uh, um, have bad debt as a result of the care they receive, and uh, trying to do a better job of understanding just who they are and uh, how their lives are impacted by that. And I will also just add that we are very generous in setting up a contractual payment program with those that have bad debts. Uh, you know, I will tell you that we, we take $5 a month from some patients. Thank you, Mike. At this time, I'll open it up to public comment. If uh, you wish to make a public comment about this specific budget, please stand up. And uh, when I call on you, if you could state your name and um, direct your comment towards the board. Would anybody like to make a public comment? Dale. Clarification first, does it have to be the specific budget itself, or can it be about the theme of bad debt? <laughs> I'd prefer that it was about the specific budget, but since that uh, has been raised by one of the board members every time, go ahead. So, help me through this, because I want it to be totally appropriate. I grew up in an area where I lived on the border, so I heard that theme. I'm very familiar with that whole issue of what is that like when you're trying to decide where to get your care Dartmouth is right across the border, and you got somebody practicing, in my case, it was White River Junction. Where do you get your care? What I wanted to point out is that became a really complicated issue more than I was hearing. My employment is in Lebanon, New Hampshire. Their insurance company prefer Dartmouth over anybody that delivered care in White River because they saw with my epilepsy that was the care for, that was going to give the best benefit. That's not totally up to me at that point. If I want to keep the employment, and here's the other issue I want to get to, there's a sprawl effect around these issues. It affected my daycare, where my kids was going to go to daycare because they had to be on the way to work. Dartmouth becomes key to where I can get the medical care, which makes it possible to stay employed. They all connect. When one falls apart, they all can fall apart. It's not really an option necessarily if you're trying to keep your employment that you're going to get to have your care in Vermont and spend your dollars in Vermont. Granted, I was making them in New Hampshire, but it just doesn't work that way. It gets much more complicated. 
and the bad debt issue, well, if you lose your care because of bad debt, that can cause you to lose your employment. That means your kids lose daycare. The whole issue of bad debt becomes a problem of, like me with epilepsy, I can't afford to lose the care whether I can afford it or not because it's just going to make it worse. So I just want to comment that I think this is a very big issue, but I don't think we've totally captured it in terms of how this plays out for the consumer. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dale. Other members of the public who wish to comment? Yes. Please stand up and state your name. And I'm going to go here. It's just out of your room. So my name is DJ Russo. I'm a resident of St. Johnsbury. And I have a vested interest in uh, NBRH. I was born there in 1972. Uh, five weeks ago, I had a cardiac arrest. And I was treated by NBRH. So that's kind of like my bookend story, so to speak. Um, I have done pretty much everything I think you can do regarding a hospital service. I've worked pre-hospital, I work in the fire service, and I'd be curious to actually see some of your numbers talking about how um, NVRH's numbers as far as uh, uh, avoidable costs seem to be going up and other ones are going down. Uh, one of the fire departments I work for, we have the busiest in the state, so much so that we have to employ a third ambulance service. We're running 24-7, 365 a year. and. I have transported a numerous amount of people who have avoidable ER events. Uh, one in particular, a college woman, very young, called the complaint of abdominal pain. She met us at the door. I said, what's going on? I have abdominal pain. How long has it been going? 15 minutes, take anything for it? No. You want to go to the hospital? Yes. Dressed like any of you are right now no stress, no issues, and she just walked herself right over to the ambulance, sat in the stretcher, and she was three quarters of a mile away. I mean, that's something that she could have even, easily have seen her primary care doctor, she, or she could have gone by, I'm not worried about my phone, that's okay. Um, she could have gone by Uber, she could have gone by Lyft, I mean, you name it, she could have gone. And this is the kind of society we're starting to see more and more. So I don't really see a decline in that, I see an increase in that. Uh, people that are being requesting EMS services or pre-hospital emergency care services for things they don't really need. I think some of that is an educational thing. I really do. Um, the department I'm on, I try to do a lot with their social media, and I do that as a way to educate. So in the fire service, there's a lot of people that do not understand what we do. And some of the posts I put on there, I'm often getting comments from readers Oh, I didn't know that's what you guys do in the fire service. Oh, now I understand why we have to do this when we're driving in traffic and we have to go around or we have to stop and wait or whatever it is we're talking about for that particular thing. And I think the hospital service is no different. People do not truly understand what the purpose of some of the hospital services are and what they can gain from the primary care provider. Again, that's right. <laughs> so, yeah, you want to keep it? Bring your phone as a matter of fact. Um, so I don't think people truly understand the difference between what they need to get from an ER visit versus what they can get from the primary care uh, physician. I think that needs to be spread out. I don't care if it's Enver Reach or Fletcher Allen or you know Copley or whoever. I think that is a systemic issue that's going on. So I'm curious about that. As far as the cardiac side of it, again, that's the most recent thing for me. Um, I've seen some cardiologists through NVRH, and now I have to go through Dartmouth. I'm glad they, I got a letter from them saying that they're coming up, which is great. And that saves me an hour commute one way, you know, a two hour drive, not counting my visit. So I think that's fabulous. Um, NVRH, I think, does a great job as far as education goes with the community. Uh, could it be better? Yes, of course, everybody's education could be better. Um, a great example is the CPR issue. You know, I would not be here today if it wasn't for my life. <laughs> but, uh, that same concept, people don't understand, just something as simple as compressions only CPR, that word needs to get out. Well, how do you get that out? It's either through the fire service because they're the ones that show up, through the ambulance service because they're the ones that show up, or they're the ones that are going out to these different social community events 
and Angry Irish is one of those as well. They're trying to get out there. It's one of those things we just need to promote more of for other people. So education is huge. 